previous executive session, so uh, we're ready to roll. And um, our first order of business is to reorganize. And with that in mind, I'm going to hand the gavel uh, over to Figuratively. the town manager. <laughs> Thank you. And okay. uh, for the audience, uh, and as a reminder of the board, uh, fifth member Andrew Friedman is remote participation. Is this is location. Andrew. He looks a lot like a phone right now. Can you hear us okay, Andy? I, I'm wearing a tie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so f all, all votes tonight, including the first one that I'm going to ask for, have to be by roll call. Um, I'll, I'll call out alphabetically whenever I have a question for you, provided I can figure out the alphabet. Um, so I'm first going to ask... Uh, for nominations for the Chairman of Board of Selectmen. And I'll first ask uh, Arena, do you have any nominations? I do not. Uh, Berman, any nominations? I do not. Uh, let's see, EFH. <laughs> Ensminger. I'd like to nominate Joan Arena for Chairman. Okay, Arena's name is now on the floor. Uh, Andy, any nominations? I'd like to nominate Barry Berman. And lastly, uh, John Halsey, any nominations? I do not have a nomination. Uh, may I have a motion to close nominations by roll call? So uh, moved. Arena? Yes. Uh, yeah, can I just have a motion and a second? second. Dan made it. Okay. Dan made it very second. Very second. Uh, Arena? Yes. Berman? Yes. Uh, let's see. Ensminger? Yes. Friedman? Yes. And Halsey? Yes. Okay, the two names uh, on the floor were Arena and Berman. So I'll first ask for uh, votes for Arena. Uh, well, you, Arena. You, you, you can just call, ask us to name a name. Um, well, uh, since he's remote, I better ask everyone. Yeah, Andy? Um, I, I was under the, there was a, I, on the agenda, there was an item to discuss uh, the nominations, which I think is important. Can we do that? Sure. Uh, um, do you want to go by roll call? No, go ahead. So, um, my, my concern is that we um, follow our, the Board of Selectmen policies that are on the town website, and um, so I just wanted to check is to see if uh, either Barry or John are in their third uh, year or their last term. Um, I, can, I can address that because um, I had the same question many years ago. <laughs> when yeah. uh, Ben Tafoya's name was in nomination and he was up for election, uh, the board mm -hmm. discussed that that was not a policy they had followed ever. And the board since uh -huh. then has not followed that policy as I can remember. Yeah. There are often, in fact, the last chair was up for election. Yeah. And as I mentioned right. to you, Andy, and the last board two. knows, yeah, the last, almost every chair. Um, you know, the policies of the selectmen are one of the goals for this year and they're being reviewed. Uh, Dan. Yeah, uh, being very familiar with those policies, uh, since 1989, I believe, off and on being on the board. Um, one of the reasons that was said, Andrew, is uh, because the policy also stipulates that the term of chair goes from June to June. I, I've not been on the board of selectmen in that time period where we have gone June to June. It's always been reorganization right after the election. So you can see why that would be uh, an important thing to do if you're going June to June and a chair is not reelected and you've got the town meeting coming up. So uh, I think, and uh, the next fellow who would have been up would have been Kevin Sexton. He would not have been in his last term, but uh, you have replaced him. So uh, that's kind of a moot point right now. So why would um, Kevin have been the next up? Because he was vice chair. So, so by that reasoning, wouldn't then the secretary who was Barry follow I can, I can answer that. I mean, all these all these names are likely nominations on the floor. There's not always just one name on the floor, though. Mm -hmm. Typically, the vice okay. chair would be a nomination, but not necessarily the only one. Uh, yeah, I was just responding to Dan's um, comment. I guess the, what makes me um, uncomfortable, and I understand that, um, I understand, I hear you when you say that we haven't always followed that policy, but I think that um, it's a practice we may want to, we might want to start following our own policies until we change them, um, because we'll be asking other boards, committees, commissions, um, like for instance, the HRAC, Human Relations Advisory Committee, 
we're looking to have them come up with a policy that guides their behavior uh, or their yeah their actions. And so it it seems to me important that we model we role model that sort of policy you know following our, our own policies so that we can have um, we can ask the same of other boards, committees, and commissions. Um, I'm just always uncomfortable not following a policy, even if it hasn't been followed in the past. Um, I think it's, y y y for example, I can think of a reason to, to follow the policy, and that is, and, and having just run for election, I, I know this well, it's, it's, it's difficult for a newcomer to run for office against incumbents, because the incumbents, you know, have a lot of a, a good uh, historical knowledge base from being in the position. And then if that, that incumbent is also the chair, um, it makes it, uh, it, it gives them that much more of an advantage um, than just being an incumbent. So th those are my concerns. Well, Andrew, it would certainly be apropos to revisit the policies and perhaps we've been a little remiss in not doing that, but I'm, I'm more than willing to look and see what should be kept and what maybe should be changed. So I'll but, give you that. But we have policies now. They, we haven't changed them. So. They are, they are so, guidelines, uh, and it so states at the beginning of that section. Yeah. Uh, John Halsey wants to speak. Uh, so, Andrew, let me just ask you a question then. If you want to, if you'd like to follow a policy that is, seems to be somewhat out of date and has not been one that's been in use, um, that would make me think then that you'd want to have the policy followed to the T so we wouldn't do this till June. Is that no, right? it, actually the policy states that we can um, reorganize at other times as well at our discretion. I think the policy also lets us make decisions. It's not a law, it's policy. I think it also it, it, it provides for us to have a vote to do some, something just as you point out other than what the policy says, which is kind of the way this, this board and previous boards for many years has been operating. So I would suggest that we proceed as we have. Um, that's my thought on it. Uh, any other comments from selectmen in the room? <coughs> Ready for a vote? Again, I'll call off a roll call and you please state a name, either Arena or Berman. I'll start with Arena. Yes. <laughs> you say your own Very clear. Uh, Berman. Uh, Berman. <laughs> yes is almost one. Uh, Ensminger. Arena. Uh, Friedman. Uh, Berman. Uh, Halsey. Arena. Okay. Uh, John Arena has been nominated uh, as chair, and I'll turn over the gavel to John to do the same thing if he wishes for vice chair and secretary. Mr. Tonight. Chair, I move that we do the um, uh, elect John Arena by acclamation. Okay. I'll second that. Um, I'll read the roll call again. Um, Discussion. The motion is for uh, a revote, if you will, for chair. Um, with Arena as the nominee. So I'll start with again with Arena. Arena says yes. Uh, Berman. Yes. Ensminger. Yes. Friedman. Uh, no. And Halsey. Yes. Okay, so that's by four to one, the affirmative vote for uh, Arena. All right. Um, John, uh, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, John, for your work in the last year. Um, and thank you, board members, for your comments tonight. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to open the floor for nomination for vice chair. So do you want to do it by roll call again? Well, just for the sake of time, okay. uh, why don't we ask Andy for his uh, nomination? Andy, do you have any nominations for vice chair? Uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to nominate Barry. Okay. Okay, good. Do any of the other members in the room have a nomination for vice chair? Okay, seeing none, um, by roll call, all those in favor of uh, Barry Berman for vice chair? Barry? Uh, yes. Arena says yes. John Halsey? Yes. Dan Ensminger? Yes. Andy? Andrew Friedman? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Barry. Okay. No, you're nominated. Oh, thank you. 
You're elected. Right. You're elected. You're elected. Um, I'll Great. open the floor now for uh, nominations for secretary. Mr. Halsey? I'd nominate Dan Ensminger. Barry? Uh, any nominations for secretary? Uh, none. I'm happy to ditch that job. <laughs> <laughs> Arena has no nominations for secretary. Mr. Ensminger, any other nominations for secretary? I do not. Mr. Friedman, any nominations for secretary? I do not. Okay. I've closed the nominations for secretary. So we have one candidate. All those in favor of Dan Ensminger to continue for next year as secretary? Uh, Mr. Berman? Uh, yes. Mr. Arena says yes. Mr. Halsey? Yes. Mr. Ensminger? Yes. And Mr. Friedman? Yes. Andy, are you having trouble hearing us? You're some distance from, from us, but can you hear us? I got you fine. I got you fine. I'll um, speak up if I don't understand something. All right, All right very thanks. good. Thank you. All right, well, <laughs> what the, what passing of the torch. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you very much. Welcome to um, the April 20th meeting of the Board of Selectmen. We're picking up from our earlier executive session. Um, this year, I want to try to maybe uh, streamline conversation a little bit, and um, I enjoy an open forum, but I'll ask for a show of hands if you want to speak, and keep your comments on the point and brief if you can. Uh, this evening, we have, um, we'll open with uh, Selectman Liaison's reports very briefly, if there are any. Gentlemen, Dan? Uh, I'll just report on a great meeting I attended at the Senior Center yesterday. It was a senior, uh, it was a forum uh, designed to assess attitudes of seniors toward the services delivered. I think John went to the morning session, I went to the afternoon session. It was well attended, about 30 to 40 people. Uh, two folks um, will be compiling the, uh, the results and bringing them back to the board, I believe, in June. Yeah. Uh, many comments made about the things they like about the Senior Center, areas for improvement, and uh, some other opportunities we might want to look at. Yeah, anxious to see that. Sure. John? Yeah, I would echo that. I, I went to the earlier session. Uh, we we kind of tag team it, and the participation also at the earlier session there were about 40 people, and um, I took four pages of notes. I mean, it was uh, there was a, a lot of activity, and it it was designed by um, and worked in concert um, with Jane and and the town staff. Um, what they put together. Two, I believe they were from UMass Boston, two professors. Um, and I thought they set the stage by laying out the demographics in a very interesting way. Um, what it told us was, and we're going to hear more about this in detail, but a dramatic, this won't be a surprise to anybody here because of some other studies we've done, um, but a dramatic increase in um, the amount of people over 60 years old in this town. Um, by 40% by the year 2030, so um, rather dramatic. Um, I'm looking forward to their visit. It's going to be on uh, in our June, I think our mid-June meeting is mm -hmm. when yes. they're coming. So, I also, uh, since the last time we were together, um, visited Boy Scout Troop 702 and delivered three proclamations uh, honoring three brand new Eagle Scouts. Always a great pleasure for me and. I think for all of us, when we see our young people doing that, so I don't know where we manufacture these Eagle Scouts. But well, I, as I as I tell, as I've been able to tell this story to many Eagle Scout <laughs> courts of honor over the last ten years, um, there is a Boy Scout Council um, that has at this time seventy nine cities and towns, including Boston um, and Cambridge, and you know the entire uh, one twenty eight Beltway. Um, for the last 12 years, Reading has produced more Eagle Scouts than any community in, you know, in the uh, in of those 79. So, um, I refer to it when I'm talking to them as the Eagle's Nest, uh, Reading. So, very good. We're very proud of that. I have nothing to report, Barry. Uh, just a couple of things, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I I, uh, I know we kind of just jumped into the meeting, but I just I want to welcome Andy Friedman. Um, although you, you don't see him anywhere, uh, this is his first meeting of the Board of Selectmen. I'm looking forward to, to working with Andy. Um, and I also wanted to kind of say a personal note uh, about the work that Kevin Sexton did on the Board of Selectmen. Um, he was a gentleman, he was a friend, and he worked tirelessly. Um, and I think it would be remiss of all of us not to 
thank him for the work that he did and also wish him well going forward in whatever endeavor. Uh, he's got a lot to offer to the town of Reading and I, and I, I personally uh, wish him well. So I just wanted to, to make that note. Uh, made. Um, uh, tonight, actually, uh, uh, John Arena and John Halsey and myself were at, um, at the Senior Center. It seems like we're always at the Senior Center. <laughs> Um, they were, we were doing sort of the annual um, uh, thanking of volunteers. And it was incredible in terms of the number of work that um, volunteers do in, uh, in Reading, uh, seniors who, who work um, with the Senior Center, with other seniors, whether it's preparing taxes or planting food um, that's cooked in the, in the Senior Center. You mean planting vegetables? Planting, well, <laughs> which becomes food, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so a lot of work that, that gets done. And so uh, represent, uh, Representative Dwyer, Senator Lewis was there to make proclamations. Um, and I just um, I, I, uh, find the work that they do tremendous. And um, we can never thank them enough. But yet, you know, people are always saying, what can, we, you know, what can we do for the seniors? Realizing what the seniors were already doing for themselves and for the rest of the town. Right? So that was a really heartfelt uh, uh, event. Thank you for your comments about Andy and Kevin. I was remiss in not bringing that up earlier, but I, I echo both your comments. So thank you. Andy? Andy, did any, uh, any, any public comment or any um, liaison reports? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just um, very briefly, and I can talk more uh, when, I'm not a uh, when I'm not a telephone. Um, I went to the, um, the cemetery trustees meeting and um, just quickly, they discussed quite a bit about um, the state of their cemetery building, which I'm, I gather, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and something that was interesting is that they're working uh, with the um, building committee on finding a location, a potential location for a new cemetery building, and it's they sort of, it, from what I gather, they've removed from the table um, locating it at, at any one of the in-town cemeteries. So, because I think that was a, a big concern of some some people in the neighborhood. So that it seems like that has been taken off the table. Um, is everyone, am I coming through okay? Yep, go ahead. Uh, Andy, can I ask for a clarification on that? Are they ruling out sure. Laurel Hill as well? Where it is now? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. yes, yes. I guess um, there's uh, uh, for a variety of reasons which uh, which I can't really speak wholly intelligently about. Um, they they're, they're, they've decided that they're going to look for non cemetery uh, lo locations to, to place the building. And it sounds like they have a good working relationship with the building committee. Okay. Anything else to report, Andy? So I went to a uh, human relations advisory committee, um, and I think the, the only, you know, the concrete thing to report on at this time is that three of their, two or three of their members are, out, are temporarily out of action. Um, and... They, they also formed the, the subcommittee with the, um, Barry and Kevin, I believe, on developing uh, a path forward for that advisory committee. So they need to, they're in the process of regrouping and reforming that subcommittee. So I would expect us to, them to reach out to us or us to reach out to them or however it works to, to re, re uh, Form a new band, so to speak. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any public sure. comment? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to go out of order and, and uh, defer the, um, the town manager's report and go directly to two proclamations that we have here. John, could you hand those to me? Sure. sure. Uh, would you like a motion, Mr. Please. Uh, move that the Board of Selectmen declare April 28th, 2017 as Arbor Day in the town of Reading. Very good. Um, second. You want me to read the proclamation? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, why, why don't you go ahead? Actually, do why that. don't we take the vote first? Sure. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, proposal? Uh, Barry roll Berman. Roll call. Uh, yes. Arena says yes. Halsey, yes. Yes. Ensminger. 
Andrew. Briefman, fa- yes. Very good. Go ahead, Dan. Okay. Proclamation Arbor Day, whereas in 1872, J. J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees, and whereas this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska, and Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife, and whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, and whereas trees in our town increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, beautify our community, and wherever they are planted are a source of joy and spiritual renewal, and whereas Reading has been recognized as a tree city USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation for over 28 years, and desires to continue its tree planting ways. Now therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim April 28, 2017 as Arbor Day in the Town of Reading and urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day and to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Thank you, Dan. Sure. Where does this go next? Is it, do we have? Is there anyone here tonight too? No, I don't uh, think so. Okay. No. Tweet. Very good. Do um, you have another motion? Move that the Board of Selectmen proclaim the week of April 9th through 15th, 2017, as Public Safety Telecommunications Week. I'll second. He should be. He should be. Vote. Uh, well, not a proclamation until you voted. No. Berman. Uh, yes. Arena. Yes. Halsey. Yes. Ensminger. Yes. Friedman. Uh, retroactively, yes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yes, it was last week, right? Yep. 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 Proclamation, yes. Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Whereas there are 11 public safety dispatchers working for the town of Reading, and whereas our public safety dispatchers serve the citizens of Reading with dedication, loyalty, and pride, and whereas the citizens of Reading rely on public safety dispatchers as their vital link to our police, fire, and ambulance services, and whereas our public safety dispatchers connect our citizens to our public safety providers who may apprehend a criminal, who may save their possessions from fire, or, or who may save their life or the life of a loved one, and whereas each year the second week of April is dedicated to the people who serve as public safety telecommunicators, and whereas in 1991 the United States Congress proclaimed Public Safety Telecommunications Week as a nationally recognized week, and whereas the week of April 9th through April 15th, 2017 has been proclaimed National Public Safety Telecommunications Week in recognition of the contributions of public safety dispatchers and other telecommunicators nationwide. Now therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim the week of April 9th through 15th, 2017, is a public safety telecommunications week in Reading, and we urge all citizens to recognize the considerable contributions of our public safety dispatchers. I just want to say as well, I didn't realize that um, Chief Burns uh, sent a, a note out, and there were a couple statistics that were amazing. Over 99% of the calls that come into Reading Fire Police safety come in through the dispatchers. So it's a busy job. You've got to quickly figure out on the other side of the line what you're dealing with, what you don't know, what you do know. And it's just remarkable. You really, it's really a job where you don't have any margin for failure because it goes downhill after that. So I, we see the police, we see the fire show up, but there's a number of steps that happen before that all can move, move out. And I can't say enough what a great job our dispatchers do to help set those motions in process. So thank you very much for your, uh, your energies. Thank you. Is there somebody here that? Uh, sure. Thank you. Like to tell the folks uh, your name and your position. <laughs> Hi everybody. I'm Victoria Avery, head dispatcher to the Reading Police Department. I am overseen by Lieutenant Brown in the back there, Deputy Chief Clark, Assistant Chief Jackson, and uh, represented by a bunch of great people here. I want to say thank you to everybody, but mostly thank you to my staff. I could not do my job without the great people that 
Thank you for the uh, very much. Thank you for the effort. Thank you. Thank you. My staff is actually working with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Figures. Yeah. Just so briefly, what I want to say is um, we talk a lot about patrol officers being the face of the Reading Police Department. The dispatch is a voice of the Reading Police Department, the Reading Fire Department. They're the unseen people. They do so much behind the scenes that the public doesn't realize. And their job is, I guess, one of the most stressful jobs I've ever seen. I don't think I could do it, and I don't think most of us could do it. It takes a very unique person to be able to multitask, listen, the fire, police, dispatch everything out. And I just want to say uh, we very much appreciate the hard work that all the dispatchers do here in the town of Reading. Well, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, this dispatch is one of the things Chief Burns did send over that. But I, I wanted to, to pull out to you is that Within the dispatch center, we have quite a few long-term employees. I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with that. I wanted to mention that Victoria Lucia has 15 years' experience. Gina Saunders with 32, Sue Tapley with 24, Ryan Mahoney with 14, Joe Pignotta with 10, Debbie Hayes with 10, and then it goes down from there as they get hired. So I just wanted to point out to you, we have long-term employees in a very stressful job, and, and how that is, is quite a bit to, to the training and whatnot that goes on in there. And, we don't get to see them on the fire side whatsoever. You know, we just talk to them on the radio, which is not always good for them because if there's an issue or problem, they hear from us on the phone. But uh, other, than, other than that, it's very nice that we have such long-term employees that we get to know them over a period of time doing different things. We have joint upcoming training coming in in which they will be involved with us also. So with that aspect, it's wonderful. And thank I would just like to thank uh, the also came, Sergeant Corey Santaski. Also, Matt Thatcher was actually a dispatcher for us for 11 years before becoming a police officer. Also, Eric Drowski and Lieutenant Kevin Brown, once you introduce the fight. Uh, we'll just go right ahead. Will you announce yourself, sir? <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Captain Mr. Loftus? Eric Loftus. I thought you'd in for a second. No, go ahead. Dave Lewis. And Rob Loring. Mr. Loring is. Uh, Wonderful enough, Mr. Loring stopped nice and walking. Mr. Loring recently ran a marathon on behalf of um, Children's Hospital and Derek Loft is his daughter. So I'd like to publicly say thank you for doing that. It was an awesome job. His time was very good, too, they tell me. I don't know another one, as you can tell. <laughs> so I thank you for having us here. And uh, Board of Cyclists, look, thank you for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule, but it means a lot to us that you recognize the people that take care of us. We take care of the public. They take care of us. Well, public safety is job one of a community. It's the first responsibility of any government. And the, <coughs> the agents of that are, are you, you ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much for the efforts you put in every day and every night. Thank, thank you. Let's see. Um, I don't believe our town manager has a report. Um, that moves us to appointing a um, board of assessors candidate in conservation. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we uh, the volunteer appointment subcommittee met on Tuesday evening. Uh, we interviewed. Uh, uh, let's see, which gentleman did we interview? I think it was Mike Golden. Yes, yes Mike. Who is uh, the brother of a current assessor? And uh, Bob filed all the requisite paperwork with the board, uh, just declaring that, uh, which he's required to do by ethics laws. Uh, and promise that any discussions over Thanksgiving or other dinners will be about baseball and youth <laughs> and, and will not concern matters pertaining to assessment. Uh, this is a position where it's really hard to find qualified people. Uh, and I want to thank um, Steve, Mr. Jim, Steve Crook, who just. Uh, he was around here. Oh, he's, is he around? He's, he's taking <laughs> Take our a picture. picture. Of yourself. He's memorializing <laughs> the fact that he's <laughs> not thank on you the board for your of service. <laughs> and, uh, you, you did yeoman service for a lot longer than we had uh, hoped to have to have you on there. and I. You're a good, good troop to do that. Uh, so with that in mind, I would uh, move to nominate uh, Mike Golden for a term on the Board of Assessors ending June 30th, 2018. And needing renewal is also Bob Marshall. He actually, his term actually went through April this year, so we need to renew him. Bob Marshall uh, for a term on the Board of Assessors for a term ending June 30th, 2020. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those uh, in Dan? Yes. Uh, I have a question. I I didn't receive the resumes 
um, for the volunteers. So oh. I'm in yeah, a bit of a bind of uh, not being able to vote on, on this one, I'm afraid. All right. That's, that's uh, your Andrew, we did send those out this week. You may not have seen them. Yeah. Okay. It would have been, I think, this morning because the VASC met last okay. night. Huh. All right. My, my, then, then that must be my bad. No, it was yesterday, wasn't it? It was yesterday, was it? Yes. When did you meet? They met Tuesday night. Yeah, it was yesterday. Then. So yesterday is when those were sent out yesterday morning. Okay. Um, Mr. Berman. Uh, yes. Mr. Arena says yes. Mr. Halsey, Halsey yes. Enzwinger, yes. Mr. Friedman? I have to abstain. Okay. We have a 4 0 1 vote. So we congratulate Mr. Golden. Thank him for his future service. Yes. And you have another appointment. We, we do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had one candidate for an opening on the uh, Conservation Commission, Bob Hayes. We interviewed him. Uh, Bob's a longtime local resident. Uh, we, uh, the VASC voted 2 0 to offer Bob a uh, an associate term, um, simply because he, he he had a very good civic heart, but he is not intimately familiar with what the CONSCOM does right now. We felt by putting him up at a, an associate position, he'll be allowed to uh, participate in the discussions. If he's needed for a quorum call, the chair is able to appoint him. So uh, make that nomination. Okay. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Yeah. Um, so. I guess we have a we have a vacancy. We have a volunteer. Um, I would would you entertain a motion to <coughs> appoint the applicant to the uh, to the position? What's the balance of the term on this position? I think it's also Same. six thirty twenty eighteen. Yes. Yeah. So it's not a full term, first of all. Yeah. Um, I I think that um, somebody's ready to give their time. They ought to be able to have a vote, and I would I would. Prefer to, to nominate him to fill a voting position since we have a vacancy. Do you know if he came in for that stated role? Dan? He did for the the full time position. He did. And did, um, okay. All right. Uh, um, procedurally, how you could handle this is accept both motions and then <coughs> perhaps take a vote on the full first because that would take precedence over the we could. second. If if that were to pass, then he would be a full member. If it were not to pass, he could be voted off for associate. Yeah. Going the other way. So, is there a motion to? I I, I move that we appoint him to a, a full a full position, a voting position. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. We have a second. Any discussion on the second motion? <coughs> on wh which motion is this? There are two motions on the floor. One is to um, accept Mr. Hayes <coughs> for an associate position. Dan has recommended that we take two motions and contemporaneously. If the first passes, it obviates the second. If the first fails, right. the second comes to the floor. I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. I'll, I'll speak to the issue in general, um, being the second member of the VASP, um, <clears throat> and uh, really enjoyed discussions with Mr. Hayes. Um, does have a civic heart, has been involved in a lot of things. Um, I, I think part of the, the rationale which led us to think about doing it as a associate member is that, as you know, the Conservation Commission deals with a statute, um, at Mr. Hayes's own admission, he was not really familiar with the statute, although um, I was really convinced of his ability to work with common sense. So we thought the compromise position, given that there is a lot of technical issues with the Conservation Commission, um, is, to, is to reward Mr. Hayes with an associate member. He can participate when needed, get the training, and then there are a number, actually there's a couple of slots coming up. Um, and that if he were still um, actively engaged and wanted to do it, um, could easily slide into a full, uh, a full voting uh, member and a full, full position. But that was sort of the thinking, I think, that went behind it. Not to, you know, certainly there are hundreds of positions that um, we seek people to volunteer for. Um, the Conservation Commission is a technical one. Um, I, I think um, the, the skill set involved um, given some of the recent retirement or the <coughs> retirements, so they probably would need somebody with a little bit more technical experience, but certainly do not want to discourage anybody from applying and participating um, and potentially becoming full members down the road. So that was the thinking um, in the discussion, um, and which led us to, to uh, nominate him for an associate role. John? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, the person that 
the vacancy that is currently present is a is a person who actually came to the board also without any technical background and without question that person came to the board looking for a full-time position we granted that position and we have we have a number of people on the board who can assist somebody in something that they're missing I mean we look for a person that has certainly the intellectual capability and the desire and the willingness and frankly the space that's open was filled by such a person not dissimilar um, from the situation we find Mr. Hazen at the moment I frankly I think appointing someone to an associate position when there's a when there's a <coughs> open vacancy um, is not the, is sends a very bad message to the volunteer in question Dan as I'm listening to this discussion and I, I was somewhat ambivalent when I cast this vote I couldn't go either way but I'm thinking back to something Mr. Friedman said during the campaign that we uh, we really need to honor our volunteers and respect their contributions and in that sense I'm a little concerned about maybe setting a slight morale problem off if we don't make this a full-time position uh, right now so I think in respect to that uh, that point of view I'm going to vote for a full-time position okay um, Bob as a practical matter if the full-time seat doesn't fill the associate votes as a full-time member instead right no uh, um, town council said that uh, if there's a matter in front of the Commission then the chair has the right to appoint the associate for that matter for right. voting purposes Temporarily. Um, but that would not be routine business so to speak and only for that be, matter not for right, that session only, well for that matter and any following matter so if you will the associate member could sort of be in and out okay okay and, and just so the board knows a very distinguished mayor just entered the room so oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, any further comments regards either, either the motions Andrew any comments on either motions yeah yeah I would just um, caution that um, while I we want to encourage uh, volunteers in town as I think Dan uh, sort of reflect what Dan said um, we just need to be careful that when they're voting on issues uh, that involve state regulations that they the volunteer understands those regulations so we don't <coughs> run afoul of uh, of the state yeah that's a that, great point that would be my only comment that's yes. a great point and I think uh, Andrew there's, there's not very op much opportunity to learn with Chuck Tyrone uh, he's been an excellent mentor for other new members I think as John has alluded to okay um, great any other uh, discussion I'm going to go opposite fashion. Andrew, uh, this is for the vote to nominate Mr. Hayes to a full-time position on conservation. It's a voice. It's a roll call vote. Are you for or against the motion? I'm uh, for that. Okay, Mr. Ensminger. For that. For Mr. It. Halsey's for it. Mr. Arena is for it. Mr. Berman against. Okay, the motion passes on a 4-1-0 okay. vote. And I'll withdraw my other motion given that we have no candidates remaining right. for an associate. Thank All right, you. very good, thank you. Uh, that, that takes care of um, both the appointments. And thank you to both volunteers for committing their time for the next year. Um, how are we doing on time, right on time? Let's see. Bob, you want to go to senior tax relief at yes, this point? Yes. Uh, <laughs> along with Wakefield and, and Redding, uh, Victor Sense and Yellow is our shared assessor. When something goes wrong, he's Wakefield's problem. When something goes right, it's Redding's success. So tonight will be a success. As the board knows, but just to remind the public, um, starting a year ago, uh, the assessors looked for senior tax relief. We had a special town meeting in September and passed four different articles. Three would affect relatively few seniors, but were important. Uh, the fourth one ended up as a home rule petition that was ultimately signed by the governor this winter. And as Victor will tell you, has received accolades uh, almost from coast to coast. <coughs> so go ahead, Vic. Yeah, accolades from Melrose to Linfield on that one. <coughs> the coast of Melrose to the coast of Linfield. <laughs> well, good evening, folks. Um, 
I put together a quick little uh, slideshow presentation to review the existing exemptions that we had, some modifications that we made at last town meeting, and a uh, new home rule petition exemption that was uh, adopted and that we'll have in place for next fiscal year. It all uh, came about in, in preparation for a future override. Town finance staff reviewed existing senior tax offerings, <coughs> researched any of the forms of senior tax relief that was offered by cities and towns. As a result, we found that our existing exemptions uh, didn't keep pace with the times and that there were uh, some items that we could take advantage of under existing state law to, albeit slowly, but increase them. Um, also, we found that both Wayland and Sudbury had enacted special home rule petitions for additional uh, <coughs> senior tax relief that we were intrigued by. Locally, what we were able to do was increase the uh, surviving spouse asset limit from $20,000 to $40,000 in the hopes that, you know, people who uh, were locked out with the $20,000 limit could not qualify for 40. There's not really a lot of folks that do qualify for this. And we also adopted yearly COLA adjustments to that figure. So last year was 175, next year might be $177, whatever the state um, allows us to take for a COLA increase. Doing about as well as Social Security. <laughs> yeah, keeping pace with that. Um, our elderly exemption. Um, we adopted COLA adjustments to the income limits. Single person, the income was uh, only 20,000. And for a married couple, it was only 30. By comparison, Wakefield, uh, since its inception, took advantage of the COLA adjustments. And uh, our income limits are several thousand dollars higher. And we do have many more uh, recipients of this type of tax relief. We also recommended uh, an increase from $750 to $1,000. The additional cost is also borne locally as it is partially reimbursed by the state. And a little known one that we have is a uh, Clause 41A tax deferral. Uh, basically, if they meet the age requirement, they could defer uh, the property taxes, but they defer it at a rate of 8%. Well, cut it down to four, and maybe some people will see this as a viable option if it helps take the edge off, you know, their uh, yearly uh, living expenses. Then we uh, trained our sites on Whalen and Sudbury. Both had good points and not so good points. Whalen is very straightforward by matching a senior circuit breaker income tax credit locally, but it was funded through the assessor's overlay, which meant the town paid for it. Sudbury, on the other hand, applies their own local means test uh, and did not rely solely on the circuit breaker credit. Their exemption was funded through a shift in the residential tax rate. Considerations we had was that Wayland model was uh, attractive since it appeared to be an easy application process for seniors and relatively easy for the assessors to administer. The main drawback would be the added strain on town finances as it's funded through the overlay. Sudbury model did afford much more tax relief, up to 50% in certain circumstances. But it was highly labor intensive for administration due to a local means test. Basically, the assessor would have to drill down through an applicant's finances and see if they could um, to determine eligibility. Uh, the other thing we're cautious of is the state's potential desire to create their own exemption. And if we went off on a Sudbury path and granted some folks up to 50% tax relief, and then two or three years down the road, the state decides their own with a cap that is much less, yep. you're, you're playing with people's finances and could have unintended deleterious effects. Uh, the attractive part of Sudbury again was no cost to the town and spreading tax relief through the residential tax rate. Given our financial constraints, our desire to administer additional tax relief without additional staffing, and the potential hurdle of the state approval process, we opted for a, blend, a blended approach. There was no guarantee that we were going to get this approved by the state. As a matter of fact, there was great hesitation from the Department of Revenue, pretty much didn't have a lot of guidance in this respect. 
Um, given that the Senior Circuit Breaker Income Tax Credit is a state-administered means-tested program, we felt using this as the basis would ameliorate the need for any cumbersome local means test. We also felt that by crafting our exemption with reliance on state programs, that would also aid our state approval process. Additionally, spreading the cost savings among the tax, uh, residential tax rate uh, would ensure virtually zero cost to the town. In order to qualify for the Reading Senior Citizens Property Tax Exemption, you must first receive the Senior Circuit Breaker Income Tax Credit. To qualify, you have to be 65 years or older on or before December 31st of the prior calendar year. Uh, own, in this case, it's own. Renters are eligible to receive this in their own right off their income taxes, but for our purposes, we're dealing with home ownership. So it'll be own uh, or rent in Massachusetts, in particular, Reading, for our purposes. And income doesn't exceed 57,000 single, 86,000 married uh, filing joint, and 71,000 head of household. The assessed real estate valuation cannot exceed $720,000. And that's one of the flyers that the state puts out, handy-dandy one-pager for folks to refer to. And if folks have any questions about whether or not they qualify for a circuit breaker, talk to your income tax preparer. And they'll best guide you as to, you know, what you need to uh, do in order to qualify. Now, for the Reading Senior Tax Exemption, um, we have to throw this out there. The Board of Assessors may deny an application if they feel the applicant has excessive assets that place them outside the intended recipients of the senior exemption. For example, average senior probably doesn't have uh, a second home somewhere. You know, that is something that would be beyond, you know, we're looking for seniors that really need the, the assistance where an exemption like this can make a difference. Owning, uh, you know, substantial assets, even so they may qualify, could potentially disqualify them from receiving the exemption locally. Let's see. Uh, to item B, the qualifying real property is owned by a single applicant age 65 or older at the close of the previous fiscal year, or jointly by persons either of whom is age 65 or above at the close of the previous fiscal year. And if the joint applicant is 60, years or older. Now, the qualifying real property is owned and occupied by the applicant or joint applicants as their domicile. The applicant or at least one joint applicant has been domiciled and own a home in the town of Reading for the last 10 consecutive years before filing an application for the exemption. So they wouldn't have to own the home for 10 years, they would have to be domiciled. They could be in an apartment for five and own the home in five for five? Well, they would have to own a property. Yeah, so the they could have owned the family homestead yeah. and then sold and bought a condo. They were still owned and occupied a home in Reading. There's still a 10 year ownership requirement here? Yes. Okay. Yes. For 10 consecutive years. And the maximum assessed value cannot exceed the assessed value that is stipulated in the circuit breaker. That changes every year. And the Board of Assessors has to approve the application. <clears throat> the amount of tax relief will be determined annually by the Board of Selectmen as a function of setting the tax rate. In order to accomplish this, an application process will be in place at the assessor's office for the month of August. Applicants will need to bring their income taxes with proof of circuit breaker income tax credit, complete a brief form, and meet the residency and ownership requirements. The Board of Assessors, we do plan to conduct other forms at the Senior Center, articles in local media, the town website, and a mailing in either the tax or water bills to get the word out there. <clears throat> the base, based upon fiscal 16 tax and valuation data, the estimated impact on the residential tax rate without any shift to help pay for senior tax relief onto the commercial properties would be about 22 cents, or about $81 for the average single family property. We have a wide range in the tax relief, anywhere from 50% of the circuit breaker credit, which this year is $1,070, up to 200%. It's 
Sounds like a real wide berth, but we, we're not sure how many qualified applicants we can receive. The last bunch of data we reviewed said that 643 folks in Reading received the circuit breaker. But the data by the state is not broken down by renters and owners, so it's difficult to tell. If I go by both Sudbury and Wayland, they had roughly 250, 260 people receive the uh, income tax credit, but only 125, 130 qualify for their local exemptions. Right. So if those are the kind of numbers that, that we get, uh, we don't want to put too much of a strain on the tax base. We kind of want to try to provide at least a 100% match, maybe 125% more than that, uh, but <clears throat> keeping the cost manageable through the residential tax base. Victor, the $81 represents what percentage? What is that? 81 uh, on the average uh, uh, tax 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 rata rate of, this, of the so average you, single family yeah. home. What is that? It's got to be like one and a half percent. The tax um, rate's 14 bucks. Yeah, about one and a half percent. Okay. I wasn't expecting math questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, so, Victor, um, I, I know when we were crafting this, we, we sort of deferred to the circuit breaker kind of qualification so that we wouldn't have to basically, you know, hire five more assessors to kind of go through the paperwork, kind of defeat the purpose. So, um, but yet there is another form that you and your staff will have to review. And so, if let's say, let's say there's 600 applications or maybe more because part of, I, I know some of the discussions at the Senior Center tonight, is that there'll be a lot of effort to get people who may not have applied before for a circuit breaker because they thought, oh, I might not get it. Now there's an added benefit. We actually may see more people that qualify. So my question is, um, how are you prepared uh, to kind of do this, especially since all the applications are gonna come in at once. They're due in August. We're setting the tax rate in November. That's not a lot of time. Um, and do you anticipate being able to handle that load or uh, do I'm, you anticipate needing any assistance or? I put in a request for cloning. I think that's a great <laughs> way to go. Uh, no, I, I hope to have the form um, really simple for both the uh, taxpayer to fill out and for us to process. I hope through perhaps some cross training with other folks in the tax collector's office or maybe some areas of town hall to help us receive applications and qualify them. This new exemption, although 643 people got the circuit breaker um, in Reading prior year, 2,000 are gonna think they qualify. I understand this. You may, so you may get the people applying. Could have that. But, um, you know, I have assurances from the guy on my left that uh, we'll cross train some folks to assist us to review applications the biggest push will be receiving them. I expect to have a lot of folks at the counter um, and just taking our time to go through them. Fortunately, August isn't a real big busy time for us and some of the other departments kind of slow. So we're hoping the first year we'll have some folks pitch in. Dan. So uh, where should folks go to get more information and application forms and that sort of thing? We will have a media campaign go out and advise folks uh, up off the top of my head, I probably envision um, applications available at the Senior Center, Town mm -hmm. Hall, up on the website, all the usual places, library. Um, Any way to put it in the electric bill? Uh, or anything? Well, I, I'm not going to send the application out to people. No, no just a heads up, the, the timing and the notification. We'll put it in the I mentioned bill. that I was going to do water the water bill. or tax yeah. bills mm -hmm. okay. with right. a notice to taxpayers and okay. inform right. them. I run the risk of, if we do something this month, well, we have too soon. May, June, yeah. and July. It won't of, have any effect. You want yeah. to do it in July. Exactly. Yeah. So will this, uh, something like this, be something we put on the website? Because oh, yeah. this is really easy yeah. to follow. Yeah. Because you know, it, it was designed to be easy. So um, I, I hope, again, again, when we start ramping it up and getting the word out there, yeah, handy dandy one or two yeah. pager on the town website guiding folks to yeah. the places they can pick up applications. And, you know, I'll try to have a primer of any and all questions that folks could ask. Yeah. But again, we did this because of its simplicity. Right. Right. So 
a lot of the questions folks may have as to whether or not they qualify for a circuit breaker are best addressed with the their tax, return. tax okay. professional. Just look at the tax return, you'll see, you'll see it. Yeah. Victor, one of the questions we had was just how much turnout there'd be, and a lot of this is unknown until you do it, and the first year will be smaller than the second year when you've got a track record yeah. and the news gets out. Um, when do you think you'll have a read of um, what you've received for us to kind of incorporate into the November planning? How soon after August would you expect to have the first view of applicability, number of per persons, degree of John? Applicability? Yes. I'm sorry. I missed the first part of, uh, could you speak a little louder and, sure. and um, just repeat the intro to your question? Sure. So the, um, the applications are due by the end of August. Uh, we set tax rates in November. We sized this with a, a, uh, an adjustment, a lever that we could control. So if, the, if it was over or undersubscribed, we had a way to compensate slightly. And I was asking Victor when, if, we clo if he gets everything in by the end of August, when would he hope or guess that he'd have a first view of the number of applicants, the degree of, of uh, applicability, and what the impact would be? Got it. Thanks very much. M optimally before the end of September, in either case, if I get even a huge amount of uh, uh, folks applying, I hope that, you know, with a little help from our friends, that uh, we're okay. able to identify those and come up with a number so that you can enact the arduous tax uh, arduous task of how much to shift so when we did so when we did this we sort of anticipated I think the number that I remember was about a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar pot um, and obviously the more people that apply the the lower the grant will or uh, will be for the you know for each person um, which sort of mitigates the impact. I, I still fall on the side of having more people qualify, even if it's for a lower number. But, but my question is, I guess that's to each other, at what point do we say, well, you know what, this is really great, maybe we go to a million, or we go to a million one, you know, and go to the higher end of the 200%. Um, does that decision get made in November while we're setting the tax rate? Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's the way that we designed this yeah. so that we could make that decision yeah. Yeah. I think you know optimally you'll have a number by the end of September that's actually going to be critical you'll, you'll have your discussions yeah. hopefully in early October yeah. uh, communicate that to me so that when I deliver classification right. hopefully the end of October it's it right to there. be part of it everything's right yeah. there okay. well, well, another the piece of this will be um, because the burden in this particular setting is 100 percent residential one of the things we talked about and you know we've been preparing people now for well over a year for the fact that we'll need to split the rate to establish parity between commercial you know property and residential property so um, i'm guessing that's a calculation you're going to work with us on so that we can because mm -hmm. really parity is what we're trying to accomplish so i mean it should be that cost should be shared equally among the base. And, and Victor, to that end, if we, if, if we reestablish a parity, it would take, I, I guess, one twelfth, the ratio being 92 to 8, one twelfth of the residential rate would be shifted onto the commercial rate. Is that the math? I oh, sorry, another math question. I didn't. <laughs> <mean to change. laughs> That's well, what we right. did a last it's time. It's a one We talked about one point zero two three eight nine Google. Google. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking. If we have an eight percent SIP. We have a ninety two percent residential. So you right. take whatever the right. residential upper is and take an eight. You know, um, one twelfth of that. And move it was it over. a two. It was a two cent on the rate, and yeah. ninety two yeah. percent yeah. of that is paid by the homeowners. Right. Okay. So, right. Just be clear. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Victor. All right, Victor, any, take your vacation Andrew, you have July, any please. Final questions? <laughs> I'm sorry. Dan, you have a question? Oh, Andrew, any questions before we have uh, Victor leave? No. I, I, I thank him for a very clear presentation of the topic. It would really help to have, like, a face in front of the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking it's a Just phone. Put my picture, put my picture up. Yeah. Bob, I would like to interject that Paula did send me those resumes, so it's okay. my my fault, not not yours or hers. <laughs> okay, no problems. Next on the agenda, okay. we have uh, Steve Sedwick and an update from our MAPC member report. 
Steve here? <laughs> okay. Do you Why don't we, we um, two slides or me? Okay. Why don't we move directly to uh, Jesse's uh, piece on the peer community best practices project update? Okay, uh, I'm going to start. Um, there's an arduous task that Jesse has undertaken along with the help of uh, many of the 25 peer communities you'll hear about, and I know some folks are here tonight. Um, others did express their regret that they couldn't make it because of the school vacation week um, when the meeting was rescheduled. Of the 26 peers, uh, normally we have 25, but we added in Melrose as a city uh, because they're so much like us and we like their mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the 26, we got 18 survey responses and 15 of those have had in-person interviews with the possibility of one more interview still to be set up. The board will recognize this chart from last summer, from some of the community listening sessions. Yep. Um, <clears throat> this information predates the October override uh, ballot question. And areas highlighted in, in yellow are either more than Reading or more recent than Reading. So the message on this slide to the community was uh, low CIP communities, which are at the top, you can see the column that says residential and you know, in fine print right there. Milton's 96% residential all the way down to Burlington, 62% residential. It's, it's very clear anecdotally that uh, communities with high residential and low CIP ask for overrides more often uh, and pass them more often. You can see the total number. Uh, Reading had five override uh, questions since uh, Prop 2 and a half passed. Uh, most of our peers up in that section had quite a bit more than five. And again, as of uh, last October, or last September, those were the uh, ones that had more recent success or failure in overrides. So the, the obvious question was, is there some correlation, is there some reason? Um, are they just better at finance down at the bottom of the list? And Melrose is not on this list last year. Um, and the answer seemed to be there's probably a relationship between the uh, residential and commercial yes. split in terms of how often you need to ask. We don't have an indication there about who splits the tax rate and that those bottom. Um, I actually had that on a column further to yeah. the right and okay. didn't show it. So um, there's actually a fair amount of ones up there. I mean, because mm -hmm. split the, the, tax the, the split tax rate, tax rate doesn't give you any more revenue. Right. No, but I mean, it's, it's, it's an identical revenue base. Yep. It lowers the uh, taxes much more substantially than we can do dollar for dollar. So, that, yeah. so if that was true, you'd think the inverse would be true. Actually, you'll see from Jesse's presentation shortly, our basis of work is on assessed value, but then we're bringing in tax policy so you can understand the impact of it. So I think a lot of your questions might be answered. <clears throat> um, our answer to that slide, if you will, and with the board's assistance through the budget process beginning a year ago, uh, first we hired Jesse uh, last July as our economic development liaison with a uh, task of assessing peer communities. This is our third visit to the board. Yeah, in November, she first uh, confirmed one aspect of uh, successful economic development was to have dedicated staff. Hence, Andrew Corona, sitting in the third row, was hired in December. Uh, and then in February, both Jesse and Andrew came in and gave a presentation on uh, survey responses and interview results. Uh, since that time, we've had a pretty intense analytical focus since February. Um, We've looked more seriously at the period 2010 to 15 for reasons I'll get into, as opposed to uh, the longer 13-year period. When Jesse had been in to see you before, we looked at all data since the last override, since this was springing up from an override discussion. Uh, that's the entire period you see. And again, you see on the left, for the longer period of time, 13 years, Reading was less than half of the peers in average annual growth, 0.4% uh, versus 1%. Uh, Comparatively better in residential, 0.8% versus 0.9%. But if you look at uh, some of the numbers on the far left, the landfill project in Reading had a big impact on that successful 0.41, if you will. And our, our work more recently you know, pretty clearly shows we're even further behind in CIP. So we felt for a number of reasons that the smaller five-year period was much more recent data and much more reasonable analysis than what something happened 10 years ago. Um, I just throw this up for the board's knowledge. Uh, it has nothing to do really with tonight other than we have 
uh, surveyed 152 data elements of these communities. In some cases, we have 13 years of data. In some cases, the single point. For instance, how many highway exits a community has doesn't change much. Uh, but the point is that uh, with Jesse's help, we've built up an enormous database uh, to not only do this project tonight, but to do any a number of peer community comparisons in the future, which I thought was really important. Um, we're using the top seven uh, listed uh, sets of data for this. Uh, eight and nine were used actually for the override discussion. So I just thought it'd be helpful for the board to see that. Um, you know, with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, members from the peer communities uh, that assisted us along the way. And again, some of them couldn't be here tonight. Um, I would ask them, uh, if they're present in the room, to please participate at any point in time. It is not an interruption if you speak. Uh, we'd be very interested in your views. Um, Jesse, Andrew, and I went in different groups. Uh, very much appreciate the candor we heard from our other communities. And we're going to do our best to keep the confidential remarks just that way. So at this point, I'd like to turn the presentation uh, over to Jesse, our economic development liaison. I need my water. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, as Bob mentioned, I do want to thank any of our peers that are in the audience. If you maybe want to just raise your hand and say who you represent. <laughs> Bedford, hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And Melrose, yep. Thank you for coming. Yeah, that's very, that's very, all right. Bob mentioned, feel free to jump in. If something stands out and you want to comment, let us know. We're, you know, we're happy to hear it and glad you're here to participate. So I'm going to start with just reminding everybody who we're looking at. When we talk about our peers, there's 26 that we're looking at, 27 if you include Reading. And this map really shows our interaction with our peers thus far. So we've got those that have responded to our survey initially, which are 18 communities. Um, then we have communities that we were able to follow up with interviews. And then there's a handful of communities that we really just didn't hear back from, um, which is okay. We won't hold it against them. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to cover um, new, new growth data. We touched upon this in my first presentation, but we're going to go over it again briefly to sort of set the stage. And then we're going to walk you through some of our data rankings as they relate to the peers and also what we're calling our top CIP communities. Um, then we're going to recap what we learned from other communities and see how it all ties together into what's important, what's controllable, and then talk about next steps. All right, so Bob mentioned that we cut the data down, the data review down from FY, uh, from a 13-year, yeah, 13-year period down to a five-year period from FY11 to FY15. We looked at both assessed values and rev revenues for CIP and for residential as well as sector totals. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the new growth stuff and um, start with total new growth. So this chart um, shows total new growth of assessed value for our peers and compared to Reading. So the peer average is in the green, Reading is in the blue. You can see that Reading is below in total due growth um, of assessed values for these last five years. Jesse, that's everything, uh, residential and commercial? Yes. Or, oh, yeah, so we'll, we'll go through total okay. and then I have it broken up. Okay. Yep. And that's growth rate. So higher numbers mean you're growing faster. Even though Reading's accelerating, we're not keeping up with the growth of the peer community. Right. The growth is already in the number. It appears that it's starting to narrow at the very neck, right at yeah. the top. All right. So um, just wanted to show this visually, spatially, kind of what this looks like in terms of where our peers are located and how this looks um, from a regional standpoint. Um, you can see. What's our range there? Yeah. I'll just use my. So you can start to see that some of our um, total new growth towns, you know, we've got some darker purples around here, out here, you know, along the 128 corridor and along the 495 corridor here. So we're in that second to highest uh, category, 1.47? Um, yes. Okay. yes. 1.89. Yep. So this is total new growth of assessed right. value. So this is looking at um, all the communities together um, mm -hmm. and all sectors and an average of the five years. So Reading there, you can see we're um, lagging in uh, CIP and residential. This is a similar chart to what Bob just showed, but it's 
breaking it out um, the average of the five years as opposed to the 14 years. So just like, so take for example, um, looking at the towns that have sort of really exponential growth and my tired old eyes can't be exact, but it mm -hmm. looks like Linfield is one, Westford is one, Wilmington is one, um, Marshfield to some extent, Bedford, maybe the lady from Bedford could talk about <laughs> Um, what that is. Are those basically because they had like huge projects that kind of just like kind of like our landfill on steroids? Yes. Yeah, or is it just they have more land or more? All great questions. Um, yeah, she has all yes, the yes to um, some and yes to others. Okay. All right. <laughs> some it's more clear than others. Let's just say that. We'll talk about that. All right, so looking at residential um, new growth here, Reading is actually doing um, better in our peers um, when it comes to the residential new growth. Um, peers are in green, Reading's in blue. Um, it's kind of no secret, we kind of knew this from the first time we went in here that we're doing much better on the residential side. So this is um, a map again showing that. Um, it's interesting, we kind of have these little wedges of residential growth, we've got something here, we kind of have a little bit here, um, we don't have a lot of our peers are on the South Shore, so it's a little bit harder to see any pattern down there. But, And now we get into CIP new growth. Um, Reading is in the blue, peer average is in the green. We've got that spike in the middle, and I think a lot of us who've um, been in Reading in the past few years, we've seen a lot of growth um, in our South Main Street corridor. A lot of this was attributed to a lot of our redevelopment projects, um, Calaresos. There was a doctor's office, e-cars, um, a few others in South Main Street, but also to the 30 Haven Street project, which is the mixed use project with the big um, commercial on the first floor. So that was um, where a lot of that jump came in. Unless I'm missing anything, Victor, you might be able to chime in, but. So that's interesting. In order to keep up with peers then, it, it's an interesting reference point. We need to have that kind of activity every year just to stay even. Yeah, we haven't um, been able to keep that momentum. What's interesting is we, we've had some big jump ups in non CIP, such as Running Woods. Yep. But you're not tracking that. Here. Well, we, we do have, I do have some, some okay. slides, but yeah, that's exactly what's showing on our residential side. Like Running Woods, I think, is two to three times what Walker's Drive is, if I'm not mistaken. It's about 130 million in assessed valuation. Um, the condos there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is um, just visually showing our CIP new growth. Um, you can start to see along the highways, again, some darker purple. Um, interestingly, the communities that are closer to Boston seem to be um, a lot lighter in color, less CIP um, assessed values, new growth. Um, so this is looking at um, Reading sectors, CIP versus residential. You know, we've said this before, we're just trying to bring the point home that residential growth in Reading is doing much better than CIP growth. Yep. To your point, in 2012, the residential um, sector really sort of started to increase. We had Redding Woods. We continue to have prod, um, units built at Johnson Woods, uh, 30 Haven, which is mm -hmm. also the part of that. Yeah. Yep. So yep, we're doing um, much better in residential. We're lagging in CIP. So what we've looked at um, right now is just our peers all lumped together, and what we were interested in knowing is how our how we looked against our immediate neighbors. So we split that out to our immediate neighbors. And we're still lagging. So we're not lagging as, as bad in the residential, um, actually doing great in residential, but still lagging in CIP, still lagging in total new growth, um, especially, um, or looking at it and compared to our neighbors. So we wanted to see what that looked like in a five year trend. So this is showing just that growth over five years, um, residential, you know, everybody seems to sort of be in an upward upward trend. Um, Reading is doing really well. We're the black dotted line there, so we're we're certainly above um, our immediate neighbors in that respect. Mm -hmm. CIP new growth is on the bottom, and that spike at the end you can see is um, is Linfield. I think a lot of this is being driven by a 40B high density. Uh, what the uh, residential? Yeah. No. No. Mm -mm. So there are new subdivisions going. Yes. There. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a good point about affordable housing later in the presentation, but um, so you can see that big spike in Linfield, that's their uh, Market Street uh, project, right. um, but again, Reading is, is very low on that chart. All right, so this chart you saw at the beginning of the presentation, 
Um, it's just got some data labels on it. It's um, our total new growth and assessed value. So what we're going to look at next is seeing how the tax policy um, come in, comes into play and what that does to the chart. So the green and the blue are the lines that you just saw. The orange and the purple are revenue. So let me see if I can get my pointer here to explain. So reading, um, the reading assessed values are here in the, in the pure value. The assessed values are blue and green. And then when we think about tax policy, we've got this bigger gap here. So what we're seeing is that Reading is doing well in residential. Mm -hmm. And then when adding the impact of the tax rate, that orange line just really pops up because of the idea of that residential factor splitting the tax rate, um, higher CIP, CIP tax rates, higher revenue. Mm -hmm. So you see that, that jump there. Can you just explain that again? So I'm what is the orange the, line? The, um, the average split of our peers is 1.5. Oh, so oh in the, the fact. Okay. So this is what our peers are getting for revenue, and we're getting for revenue the purple line here. So there's that difference here where our peers have that split of 1.5. So they're getting a little bit more in revenue. In, in the residential. Total. This is total, total. growth. Yeah. So why, why I, I guess since classification is revenue neutral, why it would have an impact on your total revenue if? Because it includes CIP. All assessed value All growth assessed. is not worth the same. <coughs> the higher factor is worth more in tax So rate. the more, yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, I'm slow in the uptake. Nope. I didn't get that answer. <laughs> What it, well, how does CIP contribute to the total since it's Actually, one hand is lighter and one hand is heavier? I think that's a couple slides. So right. here we have um, CIP and residential <laughs> revenues. With Reading, we certainly get a lot more re revenue from the residential side than we do our CIP side. And then here is showing CIP and residential new growth revenues, Reading versus the peers. So our peers are getting a lot more revenue from their CIP than we are, and we're getting more revenue from our residential than our peers. But this is growth, so you mean revenue growth, not revenue. Um, new, what we're getting in revenue from our new growth. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, if we stopped building housing and built commercial, we'd make more money. If you had a split rate. Oh, right. split rate. Right. But would, if we had a split rate, would we still? Depends on the density, I think. Right, okay. If you had a, having a split rate is not going to change that. I mean, the bu it's building a, more, of it's course, a will and egg change kind it. Of question. No, well, no, it's really not. I think you know, if you build more, I mean, there's no question about the fact that if you if you add more CIP, you build it out, its value goes up, your revenue base goes up. How you split it is somewhat immaterial to that fact. It's, it's not material. It's not immaterial in the sense that. If you are taxing the CIP at a higher tax rate, it, grows it brings faster. in more money. Uh, yeah. Okay. So but 28 bucks in Wakefield, you know, the same commercial growth and assessed value is worth a lot but more what's tax the, dollars. What is, what is the differential between is that a thumbs up? The, the amount of, um, <laughs> what is the differential in the amount of CIP in Wakefield compared to the residential? Say that question. You mean the, the ratio of residential yeah. and commercial? What is it, Victor? Like 85, 15 assessed? Yeah, twice as it's twice as much as here. After uh, splitting the tax rate, it goes down to about seventy-four percent residential, the rest commercial. For example, when I do my new growth this year in Wakefield, every million in commercial, and that's just about twenty-six thousand dollars, as opposed to thirteen thousand per million in residential growth. I do understand that, but the base is twice as large. Yep. The the base before you apply a split. Yes. Yes. So, you know, which is kind of what we've been saying for years, is that what we need to do is develop the CIP base so that it's large enough to make it materially different so that you can save a material amount of money for the, res for the, for the residents and have enough CIP to have it be meaningful. So, you know, kind of back to the point of economic development. Well, there are two communities relatively close by that have. Could you could you speak up? I'm sorry, I can't hear the 
I can't hear you. Oh, Victor, we can't, yeah. can't hear folks in the audience. Sorry. What do you mean you can't hear me all the way where you are? Oh, oh I got gotcha you now. <laughs> communities of Thank community, you. Communities of uh, Melrose and Linfield uh, also had, Linfield Pride Marketplace uh, also had small shares of CIP versus residential. Melrose that I worked on, I think it was roughly 5 or 6 percent, and there was still a shift of the tax rate. Linfield had opted for a smaller shift, pretty much, um, I think they opted for like a 1.15 shift, and then in subsequent years, played with it to kind of keep it uh, on par between the classes. So there are communities out there that are small and at least had to be shift for whatever their reason. And would they be smaller than us, or would they be larger than us? I'd say commiserate. Linfield before marketplace, commiserate. Okay. And, and they were so roughly a 90-10 here. 90-10 in terms of assessed value or numbers of parcels? Residential versus commercial. But but in assessed value? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. And Wakefield still was 85, 15. Yeah. So it's a 5%. And they've, and they've, they've shifted away. Uh, they have the capacity to go to 1.75, and that's what they've done since inception. Okay. Understood. Keep going, Jessica. Okay. So, so are we getting to the point about economic development now? That's what the tax rates <laughs> pretty soon? So, so um, we're going to look at all 27 communities on one chart and see how their growth patterns look because um, before we were just lumping peers all together and then we looked at our neighbors and so here we have all 27 communities on one chart this is residential new growth again assessed values driving that point home that you know we're doing we're doing relatively well with um, residential new growth um, up at the top we have lexington natick westford and concord that are that are um, those few lines above us mm. cip you can't even see us we're way at the bottom I'm sorry, this is new growth again. Average, new growth. Average value, but I don't get the... Assessed value. So what are the values on the y-axis then? That's $80 million? That, that's the yeah. inc is that the incremental? Yeah, it's the incremental yeah. value yep. and assessment. Yeah, okay, yes. okay, now I understand, thank you. So you can see that Linfield spike again. You can see our spike in 2013, but what this is really showing to me is that, you know, a lot of the peers are above us in CIP new growth. So before we actually identify who's actually doing better overall, I was interested in seeing who's actually surpassed us in the past five years, who was below us in 2011 and is now doing better in 2015. So this chart shows that. So the communities that are in the orange are those that um, were, let's say, worse off in 2011 but doing better in 2015 for CIP new growth. Um, almost all of these communities that were below us did surpass us in 2015. I did the same for residential. Um, again, we're doing well in residential, so only two communities surpassed us in 2015. So I think we want to drive this point home. We're lagging in CIP. We're doing better in residential. We're behind our neighbors in CIP and total new growth. So really, ultimately, what we want to do next is identify who's doing best in CIP new growth. So big reveal here, these are the top seven CIP new growth towns. Westboro, Linfield, Mansfield, Wakefield, Dedham, Burlington, and Lexington. So to your point, when you were looking at the, that chart, Those that's, the ones, yeah. yeah, that was, um, many of them were, were listed there. So these communities have the highest proportion of CIP new growth over the past five years. These are the communities that we're going to be sort of benchmarking ourselves at through when I talk through this data, um, through some of these data sets. Uh, Where's that going in Wakefield? What's growing there? What parts of town? At the head of the lake, like Converse and consistent assessing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, if you remember, if you remember last, uh, the first time we met, um, when we talked about this, um, the personal property tax case oh, study. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So they they've definitely done well there. Mm -hmm. So this is visually showing where our high CIP communities are. Um, they're outlined in yellow, so you're going to see a series of maps that are so very similar. Went everywhere to this. but us. <laughs> well, actually, that's interesting, Barry. Yeah. So the thing that jumps off this page to me is every one of those communities is on one or more major thoroughfares. So yeah. we've got the Except 128 for corridor. Us. <laughs> we've got the 128 corridor. We've right. got the 495 corridor. We got Route Three, 
Route 90. I mean, even pretty, even up here, we've 90, got 90 west. Um, what is that? 24 going south near yeah. Dedham. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Route 1 too does. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's on a major thoroughfare is doing better than us. And we got two of them. And we have two. So <laughs> and what's commuter rail. So what are we doing wrong? Okay, that's a good question. So <laughs> why are they doing so well? Let's look at more data. So um, as Bob mentioned, we had a plethora of data, 150, over 150 data sets that we looked at. And what we really tried to do is narrow it down because I'm already at 90 slides. I just couldn't do any more. <laughs> and we picked out the best, um, <laughs> the best pieces of information that were interesting and that relate back to this project. Some of them you'll find that really don't have any connection, but we wanted to bring it to you to sort of show you where the highlights are. All right, so we're going to first walk you through population density. Um, not surprisingly, the high dense communities are closer to the city, less dense as you get further out. As it relates to our high CIP communities, it's, it's a little mixed. You don't really see a lot of um, pattern yet. You see some light, light high CIP towns, you see some darker purples. So what we've done to sort of clarify this is do a raking chart for each of our data set. So you'll see this pretty much throughout the presentation, a, a, a ranking chart. This one is for population density. So up top is less dense, but on the bottom is more dense. The green communities represent our high CIP communities. So here it's very sort of evenly distributed. Really there's not a pattern that we, that we see here. Um, Reading is highlighted in yellow. You know, we're actually, compared to our peers, we're pretty dense. Um, Melrose is the, is the most dense, Belmont, Winchester, and Stono, as well as Wakefield. So we wanted to break up the population into cohorts and see how that looked yeah. against our CIP communities. So population's under five here. Um, there's uh, some really dark colors on the map. We've got Melrose, Bedford, Natick, Dedham all have very high populations under five. Um, but when it comes to our high CIP communities, it's kind of all over the map. So when we look at our um, ranking chart, we don't really see an observable relationship between this particular age cohort and our high CIP towns. Um, when it comes to Reading, we actually do have a very high percentage of this population, but it has declined in, in the past five years. Melrose has a very high percentage of this population, the highest. So this is our school-aged population, 5 to 19. Mm. So um, again, when we look at our CIP communities, we're not really seeing a pattern quite yet. We see some whites, we see some medium purples, we see some dark purples. Um, so let's take a look at our chart here. So what we're seeing is that um, in 2015 and the percent change, there seems to be a lower population of school-aged children with our high CIP communities. Um, we're ranked sort of in the middle, and we've actually grown in this age cohort. Um, so why do high CIP towns have a decrease in school-aged population? I looked at this a little bit more um, in, in detail, and I thought, okay, maybe it's related more to the residential side of things. So this you're actually seeing, so we're shifting, our, our highlighted communities now are those the top seven high residential new growth towns, so they're the opposite of our CIP towns. Just a question, were you getting the uh, school age data directly from the uh, school committees? Census. The U.S. Census is only done every 10 years. This, is the, AC, this is the ACS survey. ACS? Which is census-based data. Well, how do you get it for 2015? That's, that's the, it, they do it every five years. years. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's what we're seeing here is that our high residential new growth communities generally have higher populations of school age kids. And then I was thinking, okay, what could this be related to? Looked at vacant residential land, and it seems that those communities do relate back to high amounts of vacant residential land, um, which is interesting. We'll talk a little bit um, more about this a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but it could also be that these, these towns that are highlighted, um, the high residential towns, generally have um, higher population increases, so they're growing in general. Um, maybe they're becoming more desirable communities, but we'll look into this a little bit more detail. So this slide is um, really interesting to me. We see a lot of dark purple in our high CIP towns, and this is our population 65 and plus. So, um, and they're actually more closer to the Boston area, less so on the outskirts. <coughs> so when we look at our ranking chart here, we do see that a lot of the high CIP towns have higher populations of our senior population. Um, Reading is ranked a little bit lower, and we've actually not grown as high as some of our peers. Um, but 
Um, what this is clearly showing is that for some reason, and we're, we're actually really not sure, but our high CFP towns have this larger percentage of this age population. So when I tried to look at, you know, maybe some other reasons why, um, the only other thing that really showed up was that some of these communities are over their 10% for affordable housing. They have very mm -hmm. high percentages. Dedham, Le Linfield, Burlington, Lexington all have, they're all over their 10%. Mm. So, um, so if anybody has any, you know, thoughts on this, let me know because I do think it's really interesting. Well, maybe those towns, did you look to see if maybe those towns sort of said, you know, our, our population of seniors is increasing, you know, instead of doing, you know, another, you know, 100 units of, of rental housing, we do over 55. I yeah. Mean, how many, can you, yeah, I'm sure you can measure how many of those towns have done over 55. Yeah, we would, we would probably have to go town by town and, and ask them, but that's, I think that's certainly a trend in the region just because as we've seen in demographic information and population projections, that cohort is gonna increase regardless. So, um, I mean, we have, how many units of 55 at Reading Woods? I mean, it's, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's starting to be a trend right. to have those communities, so, um, yeah. Um, and this is just showing the breakdown of the cohorts and the change over time, so, um, to well, the right. you really see the green there, the change yeah. in over 65, mm -hmm. it just jumps yeah. off the page at you. Yeah, so we have a lot of positive increases in 65, a lot of negative uh, or decreases in under five. The five to 19, it's, it's kind of all over the place, but what's interesting is that nine of those communities that are decreasing in the school age kids are increasing and they're 65 plus. So it's, it's, it's that we're seeing like a shift in population that it's, that it's getting more um, on the on the older side in some of these communities. So I wonder why this flies in the face of the information we saw yesterday. I don't think I don't think it's I don't think it's varying from that because what we're looking at is this compared to our peers. So Reading may rank low compared to these particular communities, but if we actually looked at like the state, so as those a whole, aren't real. Those aren't actual numbers. Those are comparative percentages. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think the uh, UMass numbers are much more area, not town specific. So they're no, they were. Well, I think they were ready. Yeah. So what well, I MA, think MAPC is the same way. Believe me, it's generic. They don't study Reading all by themselves. They have a model that's generic, and okay. they apply it to each. Okay. I'm just community. wondering why that why that was presented that way. Yeah, it is thing. interesting. Well, I, I think mean, it was presented as Reading, Reading, Reading area. Maybe. It was presented with 2000 and 2010 uh, census data, and then an estimate from I can't remember the name of the group for 2020 and 30. That was regional. The, the 2000 and 2010 was definitely Reading, but the yeah. projection was a regional projection used in Reading. Yeah, so a lot of these numbers, they are increasing and they are in the region. So you're using sort of a projection model and Reading fits within that model. Um, it's just where, as compared to these communities, if we were to do a comparison with all the communities in the Commonwealth, Reading may sit higher or lower, but when it comes to... So this these, isn't really about population, this is about a comparative number. Um, well, it is about population. So the the percentages in 2010 is a is a percentage like Concord, for example, 20% of their population is 65 and older. So those are based on numbers. And then the change is the difference between the years, what that what that cohort is doing. Okay. Uh, they, those don't seem to match. I mean, I'm not questioning the numbers. Yeah. We're, we seem to be getting. I'm saying to Jesse is we seem to be getting conflicting information mm -hmm. within 24 hours. Yeah, I would um, agree with that. <laughs> I know Bob warned me, but um, all right. So population summary: what we're seeing is that there's not really a connection between density and high CIP towns. High CIP towns seem to have a lower percentage of school-age kids. Um, that this population is actually probably more connected with high residential new growth towns, which seem to be more in, um, related to the amount of vacant residential land. Um, we will talk about this a little bit in education. And then high CIP towns appear to have a higher population um, of 65 and plus. We're not exactly sure why, but these high CIP towns do have a higher amount of affordable housing. Are we gonna get into what this all means? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I can, skip, I can skip all this and go no, to no, the end. No, no, <laughs> no, maybe the building. Um, okay. So we're going to look at households uh, income incomes and home prices next. Um, again, we have that um, wedge here that I've 
been noticing we've got higher incomes here and here um, and the high CIP communities it's a little hard to see it hot in here on the map but Jesse, um, all this work you're doing is primarily to show correlation between high CIP and yes, some other yes. uh, demographic or physical characteristic of the some data. other data right. sample yeah so here we have the income um, you know high CIP towns it looks like they generally have lower median household incomes um, Reading is actually doing pretty well we're sort of in the middle and we've been growing um, growing in the middle so um, that's, I don't think anything surprising we didn't already know about Reading single-family home sales prices in 2015 um, that wedge is still there we see the dark greens on the route 2 corridor and um, up in this area here and then when we look at our ranking chart um, it's a little less clear but in 2015 and the change from 2010 appears to, to, to show that higher CIP towns generally have lower home prices so with this in mind you might be thinking oh no high CIP towns have lower median incomes and lower home prices it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cause this or or one cause the other um, but it's kind of saying that regardless of the, the status you know these communities are getting the projects so I think we need to dig a little bit further in understanding why and one thing we all know is highway oops highway What's access demand? I mean that actually follows very logically it's a supply and demand thing I mean if there's more commercial um, the likelihood of the demand for residential goes down when the, that goes down the price goes down when the price goes down the people that buy it are buying it with smaller incomes I mean it, it's perfectly logical if you follow if you follow that bouncing ball mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so one thing we we all know is roadway access some access points um, when we look at our high CIP communities and the number of major roadway access points along our highways we see a, a clear trend that's that's nothing that we didn't know before um, and we're actually really high up on the list you know we're tied for fifth rank we have four highway access points Danvers and Lexington have two um, but this is uh, this is a really important point to drive home it was pointed out in our EDSAT as being yep. like the most important, the very important location factor in the EDSAT. It was highway access. Furthermore, when we talked with our peers, they said that one of the reasons developers and businesses go to the communities is, is location. Now this could mean it was closer to Boston, but many of them when they talked about location said they have highway access. They have great, um, great on and uh, access to, to these um, major roadways. All right, so I know Andrew talked to you last time about um, you know sort of the goal, and and one of the goals is not necessarily um, job creation. It, it was in one of his last jobs, but I'm going to actually talk to you a little bit about employment and a little bit about wages because we actually found some interesting um, interesting points that I want to bring to your attention. So what we're seeing here is average monthly employment in 2015, and a lot of our CI, high CIP communities have very high numbers of average monthly employment and here's our ranking chart um, especially in the change our high CIP towns generally have higher average monthly employment I just want to point out that this is documenting how many jobs are available in the community mm. not necessarily how many of the residents are employed so this is basically the employers reporting to the the Department of Labor and Workforce Development how many jobs they have well, that, that follows pretty quickly. High CIP means more people driving for their jobs, right? Yeah, uh, the, the roadways. High CIP means more people are working in your community. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> so when we're looking at average monthly employment as a percentage of our working age population, we start to see an interesting um, pattern here. So the dark communities are what we're going to be calling our import communities they are over 100 percent meaning they have more jobs than they have working age population so they actually bring people to their community to work there so what does this do this actually increases your daytime population allows for folks to um, then support some of your other local businesses I can't take credit for this chart um, John helped me with this one and um, Although it, it looks a little complicated, I actually really love it. So hopefully I can walk you through it. Um, 
or John, if you want to take over. But yeah, really quick. So on the bottom, it's the total <laughs> average employment in the town. So for example, if we take the big bubble in the upper right, it's Burlington. They've got about 45. What is that? 43.7. K thousand people showing up every day on average. Mm -hmm. The height of the bubble, where it is vertical wise, is the growth in that 43.7 number since 2010. So that was at 37 point something, it's going to 43. It's accelerating. Yeah. It's accelerating. Yeah. And the size of the ball yeah. is the ratio of the number of people showing up to the employable population of the town. Mm. In other words, Burlington is. Andy, Andrew calls it respirating. They're, they're bringing in people in the daytime and they're driving home at night. Uh -huh. They're spending their disposable dollars in the town. They're, they're working at, at companies and places that contribute to the CIP growth. Where's Reading? Look at the other end of the scale, that little teeny, red dot. Teeny, That's teeny, it. In case you can't That's see us. it. That's us. So and we've got right 7,000 uh, monthly employment. A five-year growth. We've added over the previous five years a, thousand a whole thousand employees. And we've got um, 0.45, so r ratio compared to the number of people that are employable in the town, or in that age bracket, we've only got about 45% of them that um, work in the town. So people leave Reading during the day. Yeah. Correct. Better so we're too small, we're not growing, and we don't have a lot of CIP. So that's kind of your three strikes rule. Whereas Which explains why downtown businesses continue to struggle, because there's nobody there during the day right. to support them. They're spending their money elsewhere. Exactly. Thank you, John. That was that was great. That was perfect. Just what no, but I really I really liked this chart a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. So here is the ranking chart, just bringing home that point, um, giving an idea of who imports, who exports their daytime population, um, which is, I mean, to John's point, it's 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 a very important point to drive home. And Reading is is very low. So we're going to look quickly at weekly average weekly wages. Um, again, we do see a lot of dark purple within our high CIP towns. Um, Reading is very light. So that's because we're dead last in the amount of weekly wages um, people earn in these jobs. Um, the high CIP in towns Redding. in Reading. So not only are we exporting people leaving, the, the ones, ones that, that are working are here, here are making less money because the type of jobs that we're creating Maybe they're in retail, or maybe they're minimum wage jobs. Exactly. They're not the office parks. They're not um, medical arts. Right. You got the Bedford Law Miracle firms. over there for us. Well, don't worry. We have that. We have that information. We're going to go through that. <coughs> I just want to point out that Bedford was number eight on our top CIP towns. They didn't make the cut for seven, slide. but look at that. Yeah. yeah. Stunning. Yeah, All right. that's the most surprising chart that's in her presentation. Mm -hmm. That's to me. that is an eye opener there. So what was interesting though, if, if we think back to our median um, household incomes, is remember our high CIP towns generally had lower incomes. Yeah. So these people that live in your community may not necessarily so be getting those. So we have low CIP and, and, and Reading and people are leaving their homes in the morning and spending their money in other towns. Exactly. Right? And coming right. And coming home. Well, they're, they're going home. elsewhere to make bigger income. But right. mm -hmm. spending the disposable income before they come around. back into town. This is this is a poster child for why we need an economic development program. Thank you, Andrew, because <laughs> this is this is the only way we're going to navigate our way out of here. So um, you talked about what type of employers um, these communities have. So I just quickly did some screenshots oh, of um, the top great. 10. I just cut it off at 10 of some of our high CIP towns looking at Lexington. So what I like to point out is the number of employees um, on the right hand side of the screen and then what type mm -hmm. of I mean, some of these companies you can't tell exactly, but clearly MIPT laboratories, pharmaceuticals, we've got uh, yeah, technology, healthcare, right. you know, some very um, 
you know, high industry stuff. Uh, Andover, uh, Pfizer, Phillips, um, Phillips Academy, um, all very high numbers of employees in these uh, in these companies. Uh, we've got Wakefield. Um, the school district actually employs quite a few people, but they do have um, some companies that have higher numbers of employees. Again, um, similar in, in Wilmington, we've got aerospace, we've got labs, we've got yeah. systems, we've got all kinds of what appears to be high tech or managerial jobs. And the thing that, that keeps these in common is that most of those people work in office buildings. Yeah. We don't have office buildings. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sure I mean, well, some of those are campuses, yeah. They're small. Like, a, like an right. analog device. Is Task campus. Campus. Be for yeah. a long time. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. so the last one I have is Reading. Wow. So we've got school, we've got EMARC, we've got Home wow. Depot, Market Basket. Take Reading. a look at the column second yeah. from the right. And yeah. that number. number of employees. Yeah. Right. Low hundreds rather than right. thousands. And Market That's Basket amazing. is paying mostly minimum wage, as is Home Depot. <laughs> EMARC. <laughs> Andrew, help. Help, Andrew. <laughs> well, well, running schools would be a bigger number if we had the whole thing up, yeah. wouldn't they? Uh, yeah. I mean, we had all Wakefield schools. Yeah, they report yeah. it differently. All they're right, better. so, so to I bring... changed my mind, Andrew. We do need jobs. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not that we necessarily, I mean, that may not be the goal, but the idea is that if we bring people here during the day, to John's point, they're spending at local business, and if we get the right type of business, we can actually have a benefit to our residents and pay them, a, you know, what they're going elsewhere to get. I think there's another takeaway too, which is one of those 1,000 to 5,000 companies is worth 100. I don't mean just numerically. It's just worth more because a critical mass in is an anchor tenant. We don't have anyone that's got over 1,000 employees, according to the, the data you just presented. We have over 500 employees. Market basket, probably most of them are part-time. Um, so just to bring the point home, um, I'm just not making this up. It's an important thing. Um, Ed sat, said it, uh, especially when it comes to location factors. We do have a great workforce um, composition, um, and we have educated workers. So um, I'm actually going to take a break so I can drink some water. Bob's going to talk about the education piece of this. And this okay. is really well done, Jesse. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. I know it's a Don't worry, I'm not done yet. This is <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. You'll be back. This is just part one. This is yes, like I'm Star Wars. It's like seven, <laughs> seven series. So. Yeah, I'm going to give you a, a short break into education, which there's some interesting slides here. Um, this first one is what I call discretionary spending. Uh, the state sets a minimum uh, budget for every school district that must be spent by a community. Uh, and this is what uh, districts actually choose to spend either at or above those figures in 2010 and then in 2015. <clears throat> so Reading increased from 14% above the minimum, if you will, to 19% above the minimum. But look at how many towns it lost in terms of its ranking. Uh, I think it's six. One, two, three, yep. So six communities did even better than Reading's increase from 14 to 19. Is this uh, the so-called foundation budget? Uh, the foundation budget is the minimum. Okay. So that's net school spending. This is, um, I, get, I call it discretionary. I had a chat with the superintendent, and he agreed that the things we're looking at are the right things to look at. Okay. Um, and note where the green lines generally are. Uh, generally speaking, the highest discretionary spending uh, towns have high CIP. Now, there's certainly some exceptions to that, uh, Concord being one of them, Bedford being another. Um, you know, and we can talk a little bit more as to why. Next one. Yeah, please. <clears throat> this is just visually showing. Yeah, there, there's a map of what we just showed, um, just to see if geographic or highway access had some link. And this is the uh, so-called output side, which I know John Arena likes to refer to. This is to measure the success of the spending, and the superintendent agreed these are the two best measures. SAT scores and the amount of AP test takers. <clears throat> SAT scores, Reading is relatively high above average, although not improving over that five-year period. Um, doesn't seem to be much correlation with the high CIP town. Some are above, some are below. Uh, AP test takers, Reading is quite low on that one, uh, although with an increase, with an improvement that's uh, about average over that period. And in AP test takers, it does seem like higher CIP communities do better. But if you just stop there for a second and think of the two slides I've told you, uh, higher C CIP communities 
spend more money at a discretionary basis for whatever reason. It doesn't show up in the results, though, does it? No. I think that's a fascinating. We've done a lot of correlation work. Mm -hmm. It's not a strong correlation between money spent and education output. At least yeah, but those are lagging. A lot of those are lagging factors. Well, um, I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. if you want to the next one. Um, and then student teacher ratio is another measure of, uh, if you will, discretionary spending in a community. Uh, Reading has also increased, improved in this one from uh, 14 uh, students per teacher down to 13 and a half. Um, I was really surprised when, because I was familiar with a lot of the Reading numbers um, and the fact that Reading was improving both the amount of spending relative to its discretionary and improving that student teacher ratio. Um, but they're not keeping up with the peers. This, this doesn't show quite a dramatic change, but the point is. Um, you know, financially, Reading is definitely not keeping up with peers. And in this case, it does appear, again, that the higher CIP green communities do have much better student-teacher uh, ratios. Um, an interesting story I heard about Burlington, since there's no room about on Burlington, is at the end of last fiscal year, they had so much money left over in the school budget, they bought a grand piano in every school. So it's good to have discretionary spending. And it's good to have high CIP communities, apparently. Right. And obviously, there's a relationship. The higher CIP you have, the lower kids you have, the less kids you have to educate. So it's, you know, we've discussed this uh, certainly throughout the last year. It's a challenge in a bedroom community like Reading to spend on the amount of students there are. That's one of the driving reasons we spend less per pupil. I think I'll uh, turn it back to Jesse now to talk about the uh, workforce in Reading's education. All right, so um, thinking beyond high school, our population um, in Reading is pretty well educated, but what we're seeing here is that the high CIP communities tend to have a lower educational attainment rate, um, which, is, which is interesting. So you, you think, okay, so we have the EDSET telling us that location, one of the location factors is, um, you know, an educated workforce, but yet the high CIP communities are, um, are, getting, are getting the jobs. It's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, but one thing I want to point out. So people from Reading are going to those communities to work. Right. That's there's what's a, happening. There's a lot going into it. And one thing, though, that I did want to point out is our few, few of our peer communities have mentioned the amenity factor thinking about um, why are these jobs locating to these communities is because they have restaurants, they have shopping, they have things to do, and a lot of the peer communities are saying we really need to think about that amenity factor because businesses aren't going to want to come. It's, it's like the Cambridge effect, you know, where you're downtown, you're in the action, and, you know, a lot of people don't want to be working out in an office park anymore. They need to um, think about creative ways to bring these amenities to, to town. So I'm going to walk you through some land use um, information. So this is um, the percent of residential land. Um, this is our residential land uses, so land that's currently being um, assessed as residential. With our high CIP communities, you don't really see a trend here on the map. Um, there's some lights, there's some darks, so let's just take a look here um, at our chart. Um, there's a few of our high CIP communities with a moderate amount of um, residential land uses. What's interesting is that these three up at the top, Linfield is um, an interesting observation with this because of their Market Street project. So they are primarily a residential town, but they are showing as one of our high CIP communities. So that's sort of why they are sitting where they're sitting. Because they, they hit a home run. Yeah. yeah. Basically. Yep. Right. So Wakefield, um, as we heard, is, you know, doing really well with the personal property tax piece of it. Burlington, Burlington was kind of confusing to me because when you think of Burlington, you think they ha probably have a lot of CI land, um, but when you actually look at their zoning map and when you actually take a look at some, some aerial maps, all of their CI land is around the highway. The rest of their community is all residential. Yeah, except for mom and pop. Right. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we looked at vacant residential land. Again, you don't necessarily see a pattern here, um, so why don't we look here. Um, so again, we're not really seeing a, a pattern with our high CIP towns and vacant residential land. Um, but what, what was interesting to think about this is, is Reading actually has a very low amount of vacant residential land, but yet we're growing our residential sector. So um, 
is it that we've been thinking more dense, um, yeah. you know, with the Redding Woods projects, the Johnson Woods, the Oak Tree. Yes. So that's that's where that comes into play. But thinking about uh, yes. Um, just a quick question: that um, residential growth, in spite of the fact that we don't have a lot of open residential land, uh, is part of it that people are um, could part of it be that. Uh, some residences are upsizing on their on the same lot. Yes, like the you're talking like teardowns. Yeah, teardowns or or, or even add-ons where they create new real estate, um, even though it's the same amount of land. Yeah, I mean that's possible. I think a bulk of it comes from these um, these other developments, but we yeah. are seeing a lot like of tear we are seeing a lot of teardowns, a lot got, of additions. Got a great example out back, the little gray house. Is being rebuilt into a few thousand square foot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's definitely fits into into that piece of the puzzle as well. Um, so so looking at um, vacant residential land a little bit more, um, and I touched upon this earlier in the presentation, we see a higher correlation with residential growth with vacant residential land. Reading being sort of the outlier here, we're not. Um, we're not necessarily the highest in residential growth, um, but we are doing doing better than some of our peers. So now we're going to move into commercial industrial land, and um, it does look like there's some strong purples um, in, in our high CIP towns, um, but let's take a look at the chart. Yeah. So there appears to be somewhat of a weak relationship with high CIP towns and the amount of CI land. Um, remember this is land use, so currently what's being assessed as CI land. Um, Reading is obviously very low on this, we don't have a lot of CI land. So, you know, what does this mean? I'm thinking it means that CIP growth does not necessarily depend on how much existing CI land use you have. Mm -hmm. So these communities also, you know, this is over time. This is five, you know, five years we're looking at, and this is land use um, data. It's sort of static. Unfortunately, we don't, we're not able to look at it over time. It's just one time period. Um, but, you know, redevelopment efforts and just, um, you know, moving in and moving out of office parks, as well as the personal property um, tax implications. And then when we look at vacant commercial industrial land, um, it's interesting because a lot of our high CIP towns actually have less vacant CI land, or it looks to be that way. Um, it is sort of all over the place. Um, Westboro's done a great job with, um, you know, probably using what they have. They have vacant land, so, um, and they're one of our high CIP performing towns. Um, but what is interesting is still we're seeing it all over the chart, so it's not necessarily dependent on how much vacant CI land you have. I do need to point out that when we talk about vacant residential land and vacant CI land, we don't necessarily know if it's buildable. So, oh, okay. um, so this, you know, it's, it's we're, we're doing as best as we can with the data that we have, but I think <laughs> the point is that you, know, you don't necessarily. Um, they're not, not letting, netting out wetlands at all. We, no, uh, that's a little yeah. misleading. So, so Jesse, Lexington and Linfield, which are high high CIP growth towns, have about as much as a percentage of vacant land as we do. Does that mean that they've basically identified in the past all the things that they can build on and have done a great job of it? Um, and you know, compared to Reading, which may, which we may not have any or that much at all. So it's kind of hard to. So Linfield was a unique situation. I think it was the Market Street was a golf course, and they had, you know, right, right. to develop that. So that's a unique situation. Um, Lexington has, you know, they're showing to have less vacant land we, than than we do. I think what could be happening in those communities is that they're clustering their businesses. They might be looking at higher um, FARs. That is, a, ratio. yeah, right. that a high that allows for a high density right. um, ratio. When we talk to a few communities, um, they actually agree that they don't have a lot of vacant land. What they're seeing is um, more high tech companies coming right. into existing spaces. So, right. you know, maybe they have better, personal property tax. Better and higher use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that's kind of what we're seeing. So maybe that's something we can identify, even though we don't have the land per se. Okay but just redeveloping things that already exist. Yeah, yeah so yes. that is, that I think is, is huge and really looking at what, okay. what the best opportunity is for those areas. What is the highest and best use? Um, Kathy? Yes. Did they indicate, did they give you any, any indication 
of what attracted those high-tech companies to their communities? Yeah, they did. Um, some of it um, is just that like industry attracts like industry. So that's, uh -huh. you know, we see a lot of industry clusters in, in Lexington and Bedford and some of these other communities. So um, part of it could have been at one point, it's one community, one business tended to locate there and they capitalized on that. Um, going, you know, thinking about, you know, the Cambridge effect, every, you know, all the biotechs are there. You know, Lexington also has a lot of biotechs. Bedford has a lot of research and defense systems. So, so some of it is just the market attracting itself. Um, you know, and then and then some communities that have ED staff, they have time to go out and actually market the community. Um, so, I was a little bit more curious about the vacant CI land um, question. And so, what I what I looked at next were communities that had the biggest jump in CIP in the five years. They aren't necessarily growing the most over the five years, but they had the biggest jump. Um, and what you see here is that these communities actually do relate back to vacant land. So maybe they're just now taking advantage of their vacant land or the high CIP communities that were the other seven just is out of vacant land. So they're just, they're just not able to develop it or they choose not to. Um, so I just thought that that was interesting um, to look at that. So land use summary. High CIP communities do not necessarily have the highest amounts of CI land. Basically, it doesn't necessarily matter how much CI land you have. It's how you re redevelop it, grow it, prioritize it. Vacant land's important, but what we see is that um, you know, redevelopment is huge, and we really have to take advantage of what we have, especially in Reading. Um, I think what we've done in residential, we've done great, and we can actually translate that somehow to CI. You know, we, we've done a lot in residential with very little residential. Um, and we can continue to look for growth opportunities in residential and, and you know, priority areas. So, um, looking at a few other data sets here, um, 40R and 40B. So we were interested in knowing how many of our peers were 40R and how they relate back to our high CIP communities. I know this map is really small, but basically for chapter 40R, six of the 27 communities are 40R, but only one of our high CIP towns has chapter 40R. When we went out and talked to communities about chapter 40R, there was a lot of hesitation with adopting it, mostly the same com concerns I think you heard when we originally adopted it, the density concern, the ch school children concern. So these communities really haven't taken that as a priority. Chapter 40B, um, actually 12 of our peers are over the 10%, and five of the seven high CIP communities are over the 10%. So CIP, high CIP towns are doing really well with their affordable housing. But that doesn't play well with the comments you made on 40R around density and school children. Right? It's, it's the fear. It's we need good data on that. Um, again, not to beat yeah. Reading Woods to death, but I actually looked at that with the mm -hmm. school. Uh, there are nine kids in there, and I actually looked at the yeah. intertown migration. Yeah. It's very low. Right. It's mostly new people coming right. in without kids. Yeah. I think it's a perception. It is yeah. very low. you got to find that. It's absolutely. 40R, the town actually mm -hmm. has a good section. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. going through town meeting and trying to improve something like that, you have to answer all those questions yeah. Yeah. by the school. Right. So right. 40B, yeah. if you're under the 10%, you have to take that development. You don't get the question yet. So yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I, I think that kind of answers that question a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So we looked at this last time I was here, but as it relates to our high CIP towns is what we're interested in tonight. Um, 14 of the 27 communities do have some form of EDC, um, and five of our top seven have an EDC. So our, what we're seeing is our high CIP towns do have some form of EDC. As far as ED staffed communities, only six actually, six of our peers have ED staff, but three of the top seven have that staff. You mean by basically town staff assisting the volunteer board? Towns like an Andrew. Oh, yeah. They okay. have an Andrew. So this is sort of a level of effort um, looking at, you know, how much staff or volunteer time um, these communities are, are introducing into their economic development efforts. Permitting guide, um, the dark communities have a permitting guide. Um, a lot of them do, and five of our top CIP towns have a permitting guide. And Reading, just, uh, we have ours up brand new on the website, so that's great. Yeah. So we looked at so much data. Um, CPA and walk score is something also we looked at. It's, it's not as related to this project, um, but I did want to throw it out there. What's walk score? 
Um, it's a it's a measurement of how walkable your community oh, is. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So so CPA is the Community Preservation Act, yeah. and um, only one of our CI, high CIP towns has CI, uh, has CPA. Um, it's likely just that their their goals are different, their visions are different in those communities, and that's probably why they have. Um, yeah, Lexington has it. Yeah. And then walk score, this was interesting. Most of our high CAP towns have um, a walk score of 25 to 49, me meaning mostly car dependent. Yeah. Um, you know, I really didn't see much interest other than that in, in this as it relates to this project, but just want to show, throw it out there. So those last four or five slides, this is a summary of that. Our high CAP towns seem to have an EDC mm -hmm dedicated staff, a permitting guide, they're generally not 40R, they have a higher affordability percentage when it comes to 40B, they have lower walk scores, and they don't necessarily use utilize CPA. Um, thinking about um, the EDSAT theme, some of these really aren't a theme identified, um, but thinking about predictable permits and permitting ombudsman, these are going back to the EDC and the staff, um, you know, really sort of driving those, those themes. So these are some summaries slash quotes that um, I thought were interesting and really stuck with me when we interviewed communities. Um, and a lot of these came from our high CIP communities. Um, you know, talking about amenities and having a strategic plan when you're, when you're thinking about tax incentives. Attract for what's appropriate and establish good relationships with businesses. Um, one community said, you know, we really don't do a lot of marketing, but what we're really trying to work on is making sure we're ready for development because we can't attract if we don't have a good plan. Um, several communities talked about um, consensus with government um, and a shared vision with stakeholders because a few communities were so, you know, upset that their, their community did not have a shared vision because they were trying to do all these great things, but it, it was just dead in the water. They just couldn't get past it with anything. Um, clustering of businesses can create a market. This goes back to the like industry attracts like industry, um, where you know some industries are very well known for that. Pharma, technology, they tend to cluster. Um, good retention program and creative zoning. Sometimes, you know what I talked about last time. Base zoning doesn't cut it. You really have to get creative. A few communities, um, you know, have really interesting overlay options that create a good mix of uses thinking about that amenity factor versus you know CIP so it's it's good to look um, look towards these communities for good examples regional approach that's something I talked about last time um, many of our communities take a regional approach to economic development I like to use the Middlesex 3 coalition as a good example because I actually talked to a lot of these communities that are part of the coalition and they had pretty good things to say about it. Um, you know, even though they're competing for business, they're also supported by the coalition to address issues that come along with CIP development, mm -hmm. traffic, infrastructure, things like that. Is there a regional approach, approach train that we ought to think about getting on? We're starting one. <laughs> okay, so right that's there. his job. To, I, I'm so recommending it. the engine it. and the conductor now. Well, now yes. we need the rest of the cars. Okay, <laughs> no. right. um, okay. so now we are here. We are at the summary. High CIP towns, um, our peers, they, um, you know, have lower median incomes. They generally are less expensive than Reading. They have lower populations of school-age children, larger populations of 65 plus. These communities also have good highway access, high monthly employment, higher weekly wages. They maintain permitting guides, have some form of EDC, employ staff to focus on economic development efforts. Um, they generally spend more on education, have higher percentage of affordable housing. So those with the check marks is what Reading also possesses. Um, what's interesting is that um, some of these are not necessarily an important or very important factor from the EDSAT, but it's interesting to, to really identify from our peers what seems to be working for the past five years. What's SHI percent? That's our 40B, subsidized oh, housing okay. inventory. Subsidized Sorry, I should have clarified that better. So then we're thinking, okay, what can we control? Mm -hmm. um, what can we really do? The orange line represent controllable factors or easily controllable factors of what is important from the EDSAT. One thing we've um, done really well is um, our, our infrastructure. We're very um, established with our water and sewer and we have the capacity to add more CI growth. Um, we also have been looking at our parking, both from a downtown standpoint and also in our zoning. Um, Education is always a priority, and in Reading, I think that's true, and we'll continue to create a great workforce and a labor market. Um, permits and approvals is something that we can always improve upon, but I know the planning department continues to do that. They've got the permitting guide, and I know they have a lot of, um, you know, ideas for the future. Um, 
And then hiring the ED director is huge. It really allows us to be proactive in targeting development and ensuring some of these other important factors don't fall by the wayside, such as um, you know, marketing follow-up, identifying any, ins any incentives that may be appropriate for Reading, um, keeping up with our available sites or sites that are coming online to make sure that those don't fall by the wayside. Um, physical attractiveness is something that kind of re requires revenue, but what's interesting is it's, this one might be a chicken before the egg thing. It's, you know, it's an important factor for location specialists, um, but we kind of need to ensure that we have the revenue to maintain you know, our streetscapes and you know, our, our, our parks and our recreation areas. Um, amenities, when it comes to parks and rec, pri public sector, that, that's true, but then we also need to think about targeting um, certain development to ensure we don't lose out on the amenity factor that bring business to Reading. So with that, we have some recommendations for immediate steps, next steps, and future steps. Um, permitting guide is already crossed off. We've done it, so that's great. Um, but what I think is really important to focus on next is really getting um, up to date on our website. I know you guys are working on that now. Um, we looked at websites last time. There's some great precedents that we can use from that. And it's not necessarily just um, getting it up and running, but making sure we have appropriate information available to make it easy for a location specialist to say, yes, I, I want to come here. So making sure that that is all taken care of. Um, and then a list of vacant available properties. I know Andrew has a lot of experience with this, but thinking about either doing something in-house, but something that really lets us stay ahead of the ball when properties are coming online and um, a list of what properties are available when location specialists do come to us. So this next, um, this next recommendation is really identifying our competitive advantage, which a lot of this project has already done. Um, and it relates back to what was recommended in the action plan and creating a brand for Reading, sort of highlighting what we're good at, um, what our assets are, and really taking that um, to the full extent with a, with a branding effort. Um, and then one thing I wanna hi highlight is that um, our educated workforce within the region. The EdSet called this out as an advantage and then taking that to the employment factor when we talked about employment, that we can really use that as an advantage to try and get that you know, high value CIP to our, to our area. Again, um, these relate to me like creating a targeted approach, a, a targeted strategy, thinking about amenities, thinking about what type of industry we wanna attract, something, um, you know, maybe we want, you know, something that can be you know, stand on its own, but maybe it's something that we want to look long term that can sustain other businesses that can, can attract that, you know, that like industry attracts like industry idea. And then land use. We don't have a lot of it, but I think we really need to take a, a long, hard look at what we do have, identify properties that maybe are ripe for redevelopment and, and find out what, what their highest and best use can be. We made it. 92 Yay. slides. <laughs> Excellent. 92. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, good work. Job. Jesse, I want to thank you for the time and energy here. I know um, the work you put into this, and some of this was as much finding a needle in a haystack. <laughs> There's some needles up there, and we saw some hay as well. <laughs> yes. Um, but thank you very much for you. your efforts. Uh, this is really a base for us to, to work out from, um, from this point forward. Any other comments, questions, Barry? Yeah, I, I mean, just, Jesse, thank you for sort of laying out the, really the, the, the agenda of the Board of Selectmen. And I think that, you know, for us, I mean, the biggest thing that you had said, like, you know, on the successful towns that have done it is that they built a community consensus, everybody rowing in the same direction. And I think what your slides have really shown is that we as a town have to figure out what kind of a town we want to be. Mm -hmm. A lot of us will drive into Boston every day and they want to come home into our, to our leafy suburbs. Well, if that's the kind of town you want to have, well, then you're going to have to then realize that you're going to have to have more, more frequent overrides to kind of maintain the level of services that you have. If you, if you don't want that, then the only way out of that is to increase your CIP. So I think the role of this board, working with Andrew and, and maybe with a new economic development committee at some point that that's sort of the, the function of the vehicle is to basically have the town kind of have that, you know, uh, look in the mirror conversation. You know, what kind of town do you want to be? If you want to be this, then this is what we have to do. If you don't want to pay, uh, more, you know, if, if, you, if you don't want to kind of develop your stuff, well, then you're going to have frequent, you're gonna, you'll be paying more in your real estate taxes. And that, you know, our role, I think, here is to basically have the, 
have the community have that conversation um, and then and then sort of handhold the community through that to get to the point because we have 0.1 percent right so it's not like we're going to be developing tons and tons of stuff right and if we have opportunities and maybe one or two bites of the apple and that's it right. and so I, I think it becomes mission critical that we that we have these conversations in lieu uh, I mean in conjunction with kind of you know what the override looks like and when and, and, and how the future fine you know the finances of the town are going to be so I mean this is this is data we didn't have this before so this is incredible stuff to have so. any other comments Pub Will we get a copy of this yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. If you really, you. really, really want it, yes, you can. It, well, we'll be making this available. I'll be cleaning it up into some sort of um, something that, you know, I don't know what you guys envision. That, uh, some kind of report. Yeah, some sort of something that isn't necessarily just a slideshow. So. You'll have all your uh, Excel files behind it as well? Yeah, we have the, the right. database, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, we appreciate um, your time and the town manager's time. Um, and I think Bedford wasn't showing up as one of our high CIP communities, but I repetitively use Bedford as an example um, several times. So I think we can actually learn a lot from Bedford. You guys had a great website, if I remember. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is a great website. Any other public comment? Thank you, Jesse. Uh, the yeah. phone would like to oh. thank the <laughs> presenter. I thought the slides were fantastic. <laughs> so, Great, I'm glad you liked so, them. All, all, all kidding aside, I, I, even though I didn't see the slides, you described it in a very helpful way um, for someone who, who who's on the phone. Great. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. I'm Thanks, Jesse. Take good this. job. Yeah. I don't think it, I think it's good. Yeah. All right. Next, we have a uh, an update from our economic. Uh, development director, Mr. Andrew Corona. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> How many slides do you have, Andrew? <laughs> Let me see if I can get started. We're going to be pretty <laughs> brief. Okay. Is that you? That, that looks, looks like, like you. Last I saw, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, All right. Well, Good evening, or good night almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Thanks so much, Jesse. This is really the blueprint for how I'm going to, for some of the actions that I'll be undertaking as the future unfolds. And it, it's just, it's, uh, it, can't thank you enough. Very important. Um, get into this really quick. And uh, we'll just talk about some private sector trends and observations. Nothing too new here. Retail is still a real challenge. There's competition, not just from e-commerce, but I think the sophistication level of your general consumer has been increased so much uh, recently that they're demanding more. It's, uh, you know, some of the bigger guys, Sears, JCPenney's, Macy's, they're all reducing their real estate footprint. Capital for some of the retail REITs is drying up. Um, which is the graph on the right. And landlords are responding by divesting and they're doing different things like uh, app development. Your, your mall developers are creating apps. You're, uh, they're putting together events. They're just doing whatever they can to uh, differentiate themselves from competition. Um, residential is still driving the new growth, particularly in the Boston metro area, but I think some warning signs are on the horizon. Um, I touched on this in a recent meeting, but apartment delivery in the Boston area is at an all-time high. What do you mean by that? I mean, in delivery. 2017, uh, 378,000 apartment units are expected to be delivered, okay. which is a 30-year high. Yeah. So there's a glut of supply, yeah. but then also financing is getting a little more challenging. I think maybe some of these lending institutions are saying, uh, they're, they're seeing the signs that there is a, a abundant supply out there. And so we're seeing a lot of um, increases in non-traditional types of funding. So mezzanine financing and other higher cost loans. So a lot of these projects are, I'm anticipating they're going to cool off in the upcoming months. How much of that do you think is um, baby boom, kind of the 65 thing? It's, you're finally hitting it where you're, the 
it's not folks in the family age that are growing. It's it's the 65 and up. How much do you think is that? I have Hard to I, know. I don't know. Actually, it, yeah, in Boston, it's the other way around. It's it's people mm. coming here for jobs. Yeah. And so you see a lot of uh, apartment workforce housing being developed, or trying to be the city's trying to do that. Um, and, and you just see the, the, the just influx, huge influx of, um, of millennials um, into the city. But that's just Bo that's Boston, not yeah. greater Massachusetts, though. Yeah, I think when you look nationally at some of the better performing real estate markets from residential perspective, you have the, you know, the Seattle's, some areas of California, you have Boston, you have Denver, and these are not just attractive places to live from a quality of life standpoint, but there's lots of economic and job opportunities there. Um, Boston is really lucky to be a key leader in education, huge venture capital community, lots of startups, healthcare is uh, unprecedented, you know. So I, I think we're, have some of these regional advantages that are good to capitalize on, but I'm anticipating a slight reduction in, in, in uh, multifamily residential demand moving forward. So those are some of the trends that we're hearing from some developers and private sector folks. Um, project updates now. Um, the post office. Again, the original scope of the plan, which was filed back in January, was for 55 condos. They'd be for sale, mix of one and two bedrooms. 20% would be affordable. There would be about 7,000 feet of uh, commercial um, retail. Uh, neat that it's a historic preservation and an iconic building. They're parked at 1.25 to 1. Uh, it would increase the downtra downtown traffic and uh, an annual income. Victor helped me out with this one, but anticipated average around $350,000 annually. Um, where it stands now, they are, uh, they went for mass historic. There's a protective covenant on the building and uh, it, they didn't get they didn't get through Mass Historic. Mass Historic said that uh, they rejected their approval in February because the project quote violates the standard nine of the Secretary of Interior standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties, and quote those that that uh, that section says that it shall be compatible with the massing size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. Here's another view of the project. Um, so what they're saying is the massing, the size, the scale needs to be reduced for this to qualify from a mass historic perspective. Uh, the developer is uh, going back to the drawing board. They've brought on two additional architects and an actual historic consultant. Um, they're developing additional plans uh, to present to mass historic um, early indications are that setback would be increased, but um, so it would be entirely off the original portion of the building, but uh, but it, it's going to be a little bit taller than I think what Mass Historic is going to want to see. At least what we're thinking is that they're probably going to submit something that's uh, going to need a, it's going to be tall, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But, but that's where they're at right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, some interest, and there was an offer letter on the former Sunoco building, um, mixed-use project. This is completely dependent on 40R being expanded yep. um, next town meeting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's uh, off the table. But There's one by Biltmore and Main, uh, across the street. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this is you know functional active gas station. Right now. Yep. Yeah. Um, Cross street from Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, and we've heard that potentially there could be a partnership with the property next to it. Uh, yeah. um, 128 uh, tire. You got it, the other auto use. Right, um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And again, completely dependent on 40R, the expansion. The unique thing about this project is that the developer is really sophisticated in accessing certain types of financing, um, different financing methods from the feds. And uh, some of those require additional affordable units. So this may be go above and beyond what our what our 25% anticipated requirement for affordability would be. 30, 35%. If he uses that financing. To access that financing, right. you would need additional. And so I, 
I'm not sure. You said there's a variety of different uh, revenue sources or funding sources that they can access, but that would be something um, that, that we'd need to be aware of because they're going to look for more affordable. And then the other unique thing about accessing that type of financing, that type of capital, is that oftentimes there is some sort of local match from a from a, a monetary standpoint that that may need to come from the town, or at least the ask yeah. is going to come. I assume we're going to have to brief some of this uh, town meeting around the same article, just to give folks a backstory. That's really a question for Bob. For you, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Who's CPDC handling that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good to give people. I mean, it's one thing to have a discussion on zoning, right. what it does, but it's another thing to kind of say, well, yeah. if you do this, then you can get. There's a burden hand, right? So, yeah. Well, I mean, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid the opposite problem where you didn't tell me, right? Mm -hmm. We voted for this and you didn't tell me. And you know, I'd, I'd be wary to actually you say that you if you expanded 40R, that this, this would this actually happen. No, but, you, but, but something like But it wouldn't right. happen otherwise. Right. Right. Zero right. chance right. otherwise. Right. 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 So there's some interest in. So, so can I just ask a question on the financial assistance? Yeah, I mean, yeah, please. Um, the, the last time we got asked this, um, it was the uh, Haven Street project. This. Yep. Um, oh, Jesus. That was the Haven Street project, and you can't um, vote for it in that one. I was asking I a question. Mr. Chair, I was <laughs> asking a question. Board. Sorry, go right. Uh, I'm arguing uh, with my colleague okay. here. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so we went into the, uh, we had, a, you know, we did have um, some trust fund money. Would that sort of be the pot of money that they anticipate? And I, I deferred to Bob. Being a rookie, he said I don't that think would they be care really where it comes from. They don't that care. would be the most obvious place. Yeah. So they want matching funds from Yeah, the, what is there, like 260 in that fund, I think. So not a lot of money. there was no ask yet. I don't know what the requirement would be from the feds, but there oftentimes are local participation required for these things. So that would be another moving piece in this potential project. Good to know. It's just on the radar screen. It, it might it may happen. Um, they may come on forward with they may come forward with an ask and um, just so is there PNS here? Uh, I'm sorry. Is there PNS present? Yeah, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I'm. I don't know. <laughs> we well, I mean, we're kind of got this out in the open here. Yeah. I'm sure some kind of contingent yeah. offer. Yeah, I'm yeah. assuming that there probably is some sort of PNS. Or there's an option. Some sort of an right, option, but we don't know. I mean, it hasn't closed yet or anything, right. so yeah. I don't. They wouldn't do that without permits yeah. and zoning. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily. Well, well true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Back a couple of slides. As we've learned recently, yeah. post yeah. office, too. Yeah. Oh, go, go back a couple of slides. Sign out mm -hmm. Holy crap. Um, so that, that's a project to be aware of, like mixed, uh, mixed use. Next, uh, wine shop, former wine shop, is going to be uh, Cafe Nero. They're mm. getting their ducks in a row. What they need to do that? is get Arlington. Is it yes. Arlington or Arlington. Lexington? Arlington's up first, but that we looks expect pretty to see that. <laughs> I think it's deep. I'd go there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've never it's been there. It's a great space. Everybody yeah, says great, that it's a cool yeah. product. It is. Um, and it may be a traffic driver to downtown. So I, I'm hoping it'll increase the vibrancy down there. Um, other updates. Website, finally, we got a little mm -hmm. bit out there. We'll keep. We'll continue to work on this. Um, at least the contact information is there. At least there's some interest. Um, we're trying to passively capture any potential site selectors or real estate folks, even tenants or business startups that may be interested in reading it. So we'll get that, and we'll continue to increase the sophistication of the website. What, Gene, what's our plan for uh, ad addressing this big parking conundrum that we seem to run into all the time? There's not enough. Uh, <laughs> is there a way to repurpose what we have to? Do more of the sharing, time sharing with businesses. Yeah. Are we going to actively and aggressively attack that issue too? Yeah, we mm. we we spent a lot of time talking about it, mm. um, and you know our parking study now is two thousand nine. Yeah, so it's almost yeah. ten years old. Um, ideally, we were hoping that we could get some money to update that parking study yep. and put a committee together to take another look at it. Um, is that? remotely connected to this recent grant? Nothing to do with it. Yeah. Signage for parking. Signage. Right. But no parking. Um, yeah. No parking. We can yeah. we can do a better job yeah. of telling people where the parking is. Yeah. Which right. I think is part of the problem. It it is it True. is a big issue. Yeah. Um, and where businesses are. I mean yeah. 
you know, so the, the short answer is with more money and more resources, we can tackle those yeah. more complicated problems that we know are in front of us, and it's on our list. Andrew and I yep. have put together a hit list. And it's up there. Up, it's up. way up. And but Your trusty and exceedingly competent planner, Julie, went to a business uh, workshop on uh, creating uh, parking improvement districts. So parking be a benefits. Benefit yeah. districts, thanks. I didn't attend. <laughs> But uh, I, I think that that could be a potential mechanism for us to yeah. get some revenue, to uh, to maybe better realize the downtown parking situation and direct people into that, so that everybody doesn't bring up a you know a lack of parking downtown. Because if really what the studies show is that that's not necessarily the case. It isn't. Right. Yeah. And the unspoken word here is the mean old town manager said no to the request for the budget this year. It was not the right year <laughs> to put in 50 or 75 grand for a, you know, a parking consultant. We did apply to MAPC for yeah. a downtown okay. local technical assistance grant. Mm -hmm. Can't pay for that with the permits fund. Strategy. <laughs> but they well, came back not, he's not taking it at all, surprisingly to me that, that our scope is too technical for oh. their skill level. Yeah. Like what we need is they, we really need a um, we need brain surgery. That's, <laughs> well, our well, I guess. Well, yeah, what we asked for would be more suited to like a parking kind of a firm that deals with parking specialty kind um, of okay. studies, you know, yeah. as their primary. Yeah. But it is on our hit butter. list, and we are continuing to see if there's creative ways that we can begin to tackle that. Okay. We've had right. some preliminary meetings with the downtown business Good. owners. I think the shared thing has got a lot of potential. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Low cost, no cost. Yeah. Yep. Um, lastly, I think, um, and I think Barry, it was good uh, foreshadowing on what we need to do as far as aligning the visions of the, of our residents and our in our government and everyone getting on the same page. I think next steps for some of the uh, priority development act, uh, areas that were identified in our economic development plan um, is brainstorming. It's it's planning for what the vision could be in Reading. Um, this is just a graphic to have something to look at, but this is kind of going to be the, th this will be the focus areas of, of our economic development efforts. Everything else is residential for the most part. And I think we have a blank slate, really. Um, and it, it, it's going to take a lot of engagement from um, people, uh, from residents, from um, members, from uh, staff, from well, every vested interest. Uh, and, and party to uh, come together with a cohesive strategy for which way we want to go from an economic development perspective. And again, Jesse's study, I think, will do a great job in having us, uh, giving us information and data to direct some of our efforts. But uh, this is my segue and transition over into Julie because I think she'll talk a little bit more about this, unless there are any other questions. Yeah. No, thank, thank you. you very much, Andy. Yep. have some quick updates for you on what's going on in the planning office. Um, as Andrew mentioned, we are, you know, trying to take a thoughtful, measured approach to future planning um, for the long-term vision of Reading. Um, there's no sense, you know, zoning doesn't happen overnight. It's a long process, and there's no sense putting zoning in place that's not, you know, ultimately beneficial and used and, you know, helps increase our economic um, tax base. So with that in mind, we're looking at a very, you know, a range of options for what to do in this green triangle area. Um, there's, you know, planning toolkit, we're applying for grants, there's all different types of planning mechanisms available, form-based codes, you know. Julia, I, I, my, that's a little blurry to me. That green triangle, can you just sort of Sure. Visually tell us what, what, where it goes. I really. So the green triangle, it includes PDAs three and four, and then also this part right so is that here. By the, um, so this is Home that's, Depot. That's Jordan Depot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, down to Ash Street. And then Walk down here, Street. this is Ash Street. Um, and the, the right through here is the train. Yeah. So this is a map we just kind of put together. So that's quickly. not the downtown. That's a, that's no, a, no, no, and the purple's then, downtown. Yeah. Is purple. And, and then, then the dotted purple is the, right. the proposed expansion of 40R. Okay. 
exactly. So that's really our downtown. Right. And then the green is the industrial area or commercial area. So right. Market Basket, um, Home Depot, Jordan's, the everything. Dan Danis properties. Including yeah. DPW Garage. Danis, DPW, right. RMLD, right. the whole shebang. So this is an area that we're, we already have some initiatives underway, as you know. Um, and then this is an area that we're thinking, like planning, provisioning. Um, what should we do long term? And like Andrew mentioned, it will involve a variety of stakeholders and outreach. Um, so. So, um, some other initiatives. Um, town meeting starts on Monday. We have five articles. Accessory apartments. The goal of that is to better align the language in the bylaw with actually the intent. I know you're very familiar with yeah, that. These are the Had changes that we, we no. discussed. Are we are expecting some that. amendments around um, some of the detail in there? Yep. Um, right. As far as who's, yep. who's exactly. orchestrating what, where. That's and everybody's fine with it. Everybody's however, happy now. However anybody yeah. wants it to be is fine so with us. CBA has what CBA wants and CBDC CB has what they're happy yeah. with. CBDC is happy yeah. to Good. Exactly. let it let But it that go. will cause... That will cause an amendment to happen to what we sent. I over. think it's supposed to be friendly. Yes, it's very friendly. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Friendly yeah. amendment. We're all good. Yeah. We're all playing in the same sandbox. All in favor, any opposed to vote? That's right. Gavel that. Gavel that through. Fast gavel. All right. I know Dave was going to reach out to Alan and just make sure it's in the just, four corners. Yeah. Like every, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll get it. I'll, I'll get it. Um, and then articles 20 to 22, um, you're more familiar with than I am. Um, and 23 and 24 is downtown smart growth district. Yep. So yep. a language amendment and a map amendment. Um, and are we in a position to carve that up if we need to? Yes, we can. We, we've, you know, we've put the whole area yep. in the warrant and so we can make it as small as one parcel if needed. Um, and we've been working with the state, with DHCD, on the me yep. mechanics of expanding the district so that if it happens, a town meeting will be ready to pull the trigger. Good. Um, and so you've probably seen the press release about the wayfinding granting grant that we received. Yes. So that was a mass downtown initiative grant from DHCD, $15,000. Um, and we should be having a site visit soon with uh, representatives from DHCD and then Faberman Design. They've done a lot of wayfinding signage in surrounding towns. Winchester, you might have seen some of the work he's done in Winchester. Yep. Um, guiding people through the community. Right. And we've done it for the ball fields here, so we know it, it does. Mm -hmm. Triggering on the work. It actually works. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's work. It really well, does actually. work. Yeah. Triggering yeah. on the branding. We're talking strictly signage. <laughs> We're not talking about anything like virtual signage, like a web. No. It doesn't no. work. I don't yeah, think what, the grant <laughs> amount will cover. What they do is they take you through and they kind of what some of the things um, Jesse was talking about in her presentation. Good night, folks. <laughs> they kind of walk you through you know, what is Redding's brand and what is it that we want to, as part of a signage package, reflect as our brand? Right. You know, and how do we position ourselves to capture what we're looking to capture? We asked 20 people in town what our brand should be. You'll get 21 yeah, answers. Very, very interesting <laughs> question. It's interesting how he goes about doing it. Question. Yeah, it's interesting how he goes about doing it. He has people in a room and everybody kind of does word association and he puts yeah. all kinds of I've gone, been to a couple of yeah. seminars puts all the stuff on the wall and Touching then they feeling, yeah. you know what what comes out of it is what is sticks. this organic thing of okay that's what we're known for yeah it is it's interesting and it's who you get in the room yeah that's that matters that's that's important. Important. that is really important yes exactly. it is because if you have a small group with a loud voice you end up with a brand that doesn't necessarily match the town the town we're not going to do that. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's you know equally important for the visioning process as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, that we have a range of stakeholders involved. Good. Um, so another initiative that we're working on is the Complete Streets program. So we're in the tier two phase right now. Um, we submitted our prioritization plan for the April first deadline. Um, basically, that was a plan of um, thirty projects that will um, you know, either add sidewalks where there aren't sidewalks, mm -hmm. add bike lanes or um, shared right. shadows, um, you know, basically increase modes on, on local roads. I think they have some surveyors up on Oak Longfellow, I saw them. Yep. Yeah, and we got sidewalks. Yeah. So we actually have, we had an, an abutter from Long, or sorry, a resident on Longfellow ask us to add a project good. there, which was something we hadn't thought of, which was a very good suggestion, so it got added to the list. Those are me. 
Um, <laughs> we did, you know, we had a public hearing and we, we I worked with engineering and DPW and um, Trails Committee, Walkable Reading. We got a, a nice list together and the state came back with just a few comments and tweaks that we need to make to that and then we should get a um, notice to proceed at some point in August is what we're told um, to begin the design bid process in the fall. And then through this back and forth of the state, I learned that it's up to $400,000 per year that each town can receive. Prior to this, um, that was a little unclear whether it was a one-time thing or um, so. So tell me how that works. I don't exactly know, but um, th they were a little vague. You know, they have no, said they had. I don't think it. they know yet. I'm not sure they know. Yes, they they have said you know they have allocated $400,000 per town. Kind of like senior um, tax relief. <laughs> Who knows how many kind of apply. Right. 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 So. And so we were all under the assumption that it would be a one-time thing um, until a recent email. And so, so how do you qualify? You go through three steps. Um, so the first step is having a um, complete streets yeah. policy, which was done, done in 2014. Right. Right. So we were like one of the early towns, thanks to Jesse, um, yes. that got right on that. <laughs> um, and then it took some time for the program to catch up to us and to you know yeah. figure get backing and get funding and get you know their act together. Um, and you know, actually establish what the next steps would be, and so now we're in step two, which is the prioritization plan. Is the Main Street diet part of that? Is that separate from the complete? It, that's separate, yeah. but it's so. actually we included it on our list just to be comprehensive of all the projects that we are looking at. But it's separate. Where's that going right now? So there was a road mm -hmm. safety audit mm -hmm. um, done with the intersections. I'll go back to the map. Yes. Um, a few intersections along Main Street, including this one, which is a hot button intersection. Um, and then, the, so, and MassDOT is, is currently exploring the um, road diet for actually the whole yeah. length of Route 28, not just South Main Street. Um, really? Yeah. So th those are long processes. Yeah. They're taking a long time. It's going to um, be daunting because of all the curb cuts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's not going to be easy. No. Impossible. Um, but I know they, they've reached out to me not not that long ago, so I know well, it's... We've been hearing about it for years. years. Right. Yeah. Yep. So it's it's underway. I don't know if it's underway any more okay. than it was before, but mm -hmm. <laughs> there has been recent communication about it's it. It's interesting so. that it's expanded beyond all of the whole. Yes. I agree. Um, so... And then as Andrew mentioned, I went to a workshop on parking benefit districts. So it's new legislation as part of the Municipal Modernization Act. Um, it enables towns to you know, create districts as large or as small as we want. So it could be the whole town or it could be just downtown or the whole commercial area. Um, and basically you, you, know, you have to have a revenue stream from parking. So we would need some upfront money to put in some smart meters or we'd have to figure out a strategy for how to price parking in town. Um, but then when those monies can be allocated to a separate fund, they don't have to go into the general fund. Mm -hmm. And then they can be used for downtown or improvements within that benefit yeah. district areas. And the improvements are wide ranging. You could do landscaping, lighting, signage, um, design for projects, planning Things studies. Things that you not normally right. budget because we don't design have Design more parking. Right, right. <laughs> Um, well, all yeah. sorts of things. You could yeah. do transportation demand management programs. Um, you could hire someone to you know, manage the program, but um, another aspect to that is you need to, uh, some towns that were at this workshop, you know, lessons learned, they were like, it's really good to have a champion of this. And then another key piece is like figuring out who's gonna, who's gonna run the program. Like it's, it becomes a big effort. It's not just like a one-time thing you put in place and it's, yep. you know, it's Run like, it, it requires ongoing. Right. Um, and then having a community vision for what those improvements are, like how you spend that money is also really important. Um, so I think that's something I had um, asked for an analysis of that in the grant application that we didn't get, um, but it's something that you know would be worth exploring, mm -hmm. definitely. So I think. All right, and then just some quick a quick overview of some projects. I know I get questions a lot about like what's going on with all the projects that have been approved that aren't perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so. Um, <laughs> Criterion, we met with I think back in the fall to talk about their permitting, their their you know post 
CPVC permitting process. It's a little bit of an unusual situation there with a historic building. Um, you know, they can't just come in and apply for a full building permit because they don't know what they're going to run into. Yep. Um, so we're working with them, you know, to try to help them through that process. And I haven't heard from them recently. So I think up until recently, the former owner was still living there. So I, there's yep. maybe some site control um, challenges that they're having. I'm not sure. Um, and then with 258 to 262 Main Street, which was approved in January of 2016, um, 258 has been taken down. That was a historic structure that was demolished in July of last year. Okay. Um, and there's been no r real further communication with them since then. So sadly have no good answer for that. Um, 285 Main Street, the latest we've heard is that they're getting ready for their final they inspections. Ready. They're, they're, ready. they're ready to have the, the kind of the let's sit down and make sure we have everything we need. Conversations. Good. Dam was built quicker than that. Yeah, it was. You know what? There's a lot more to it. I think we should be very <laughs> careful about being built. flippant about this. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of side activity that's going on with that project, and I think yeah. we need to be very careful about that kind of talk. So we we are you know here and willing to talk to them whenever. Um, yeah, I think that they're quite ready to. Yeah. I think they're interested in you know one of your famous. You know, Let's get around the table. table. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sounds good. And 306 Main Street, which is Pizza World, they recently got a permit extension for one year from the CPDC to oh. May 2018. So Their it's still alive. It's still alive. Okay. The permit was set to expire in a couple months, so they got it extended. Because the property's been for sale, permitted. Yeah, and I get a lot of calls about it actually. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you need to do that? Yeah. It's kind of a new technique. It's permit it and sell it. Apparently, there's a lot of money in yeah, that. Apparently, yep. Yeah, yeah. It's like selling it. Right? And you know, I'm and I, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. But hasn't Pizza World changed hands in the in the midst of this? Yeah, they, they're yeah. gone. He opened up a business in um, Salem, Salem yeah. yeah, Mass. So um, there are people whose expertise is basically to go in and permit something. Yep. And to sell it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Right. Do all the hard work and get some. Yeah. Stuff. Not uncommon, and they actually profitable business. Barry? Hi. Barry? Hi, Barry. I missed what Barry said. Oh, so, no, just uh, mention that um, there's uh, um, a, a lot of folks will come in and get a project permitted and then sell it at a value add. So, um, oh, okay. so sometimes, I, the, the, you know, the notion is that you don't really know who you're dealing with when initially yeah. someone comes in. So then we have a number of projects pending approval. Um, we talked about the post office. We're anticipating that the conversation with the CPDC might start on May 22nd, but that's subject to change depending on their process with the with Mass Historic. Um, 162 Main Street is the property right next to Doyen's. Um, used to be an ice cream yep. shop. Yep. So Doyen's owns that, and they're finally ready to expand into it. They're going to use it oh. for repairs okay. and then keep Good. the existing apartment that's on the second floor. Mm -hmm. And that's also going to open on May 22nd with the CPDC, the hearing for that. Great. Um, we have a number of subdivisions and housing projects in the pipeline as well. So last night, the CPDC actually approved two subdivisions, 364 Lowell Street, which is four lots, mm -hmm. and 1264 Main Street, which is five lots. Um, what, and I'm not sure that this is necessarily a development project, but I'm going to guess when I see big red X's, that means something's going to go away and something else has the opportunity since we don't have lots of available space. Yep. Jesse told me so, and I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I do get calls about that property, um, not not super recently, but um, yep. there is interest. Oh, I remember. Yeah, there's actually more than one of them. Do it. Yep. Yeah. Um, I remember so this now. I just yeah, those X's are there so that um, public safety people, yes. personnel right. know not to go in. Right. If anything happens, do not go in the building. It's in that bad of shape. Let, right. let it go. Yeah. 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 No, I, I mean, I get it. I mean, I, I didn't think it was like Sorry. The, the magic <laughs> red X, but I, I, I suspect that that is the, you know, that this is property that's going to be redeveloped. Yes. Yeah, that's my accurate. My expectation. Yeah. And I wondered if we had any play on it, so. It's hard to say. Yeah. And then um, we have a four-unit townhouse project at 90 Green Street that's 
the CPDC is going to look at May 22nd as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jean's going to talk about other housing projects like 40Bs. Oh, good. That we have in the pipeline. Um, is your sense of activity up, or it's kind of this is standard fare? A lot I'm probably not a person to answer that. A lot question. of these projects have been in the queue. What? So what when you see the, like like this, these two subdivisions that got approved last night, those have been around a long time. Yeah, a long time. They've been in a lot of different committees. In different iterations. Yeah. Yeah. One of them was a 40B. Yeah. Yep. Which that will and get thrown out. A, lingered in conservation for a very long time. Yeah, um, these projects just kind of take on a life of their own for a number of reasons. I'll tell you, we, we work quickly to get them through, but as they go through the process, they decide they're going to take a little different approach, and so then they go off and mm -hmm. do some things and then come back. And yeah. Money has something to do with it, too, always. Yeah. Yeah. So... Are there any questions? No, thank you very much. Very good. Great. Nice thank you very much. Great for a town that has little developable stuff. <laughs> we have a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank Julie. You. Let's see, next on the topic uh, is our affordable housing update. I want to talk about everybody's favorite topic. 40 Ds. Just, just for the record, we are 13 minutes behind schedule. That's not bad. <laughs> not That's bad. And I'm going to go a little bit quicker um, because Make it up. I'm not going to bring you through the history of 40B. Um, this map I've shown you before, this is um, a map that the state keeps about <coughs> affordable housing. So the yellow is Perfect. communities that have been certified, and we just got certified, which means we have a one-year stay on 40Bs one year back to February. Does that mean no hearings, no process, no nothing? Or what, uh, I'm going to talk about that no in a minute. Okay. It's a little, it's about as clear as mud, but I'll, uh, right. I'll give you what I know. Um, the green are um, communities that have current um, housing production plans, and these are, that going back to when Jessie was with us, uh, something she worked very hard on, and um, um, so Reading is in the green on this, which is good. And then the, um, the pink are expired housing production plans. And the whites are communities that just don't do anything. Right. So They take it as it comes. Yeah. So redding is, is gone from green to yellow, which is a good thing. Um, I think we all know what 40B is. Basically, you get to, um, if you provide this affordability component, you get to basically bypass the normal process, go right to um, the zoning board for what's called a comprehensive permit, and that's when the fun happens. Right. So 10% of each municipality um, has to have, ten, uh, each municipality has to have 10% year-round housing stock affordable. And what's not on this slide is this has to be deed restricted. So um, that makes it very um, difficult to achieve. Uh, we have a lot of apartments in town that we know are affordable, yep. but we don't get credit for them because they don't have the right language that goes along yeah, with the Yeah, the owners deed. that have to agree to that deed restriction. Yes. That, Is there any way to go back and like just <coughs> capture it? Capture what we have that doesn't qualify? No, or, or that we know is affordable, but it just doesn't have the right I've spent a lot of time on that in my previous job in the city of Peabody. We had 700 mobile homes. Mm -hmm. and we tried to work with the state to say, give us some percentage. Yeah, give us yeah. S something. Very and cool. they said, no, if it doesn't have a deed restriction, we won't even consider right. it. And so once it's done, if you don't so have it, you don't have it. Without that deed restriction, and I don't know how you get there right. in you projects. the deed, you'd have to sit down with the, with the homeowner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You'd have to go, so yeah, to you'd now have work backwards. Yes. Nobody, I, who would do that? Yeah, I talked to one that said that's why I won't do it. Yeah. Right. But I'd be open to it if you know of any. I'll, I'll go knock on doors. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> so is it, they don't have the deed restriction because we on the town didn't do the proper stuff? Well, or it just wasn't a identified? One apartment building I can think of in the downtown has a lot of units. It's several yeah. buildings. It was built probably in 1950, and, you know, it was inexpensive construction at the time, so the rents are kind of cheap. Sanborn Street. Didn't exist. Right. And oh, no so one really, you know, the developer didn't think about affordable housing. It just sort of morphed into affordable housing on its own. Everything then was affordable housing. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, 
this document that we keep referring to, the subsidized housing inventory, the state keeps this, and we spend a lot of time on it. We have a shared staff person that spends almost exclusive time on this. Um, and as a result of um, the, the 40B down at the train station, we are now at 8.49%. So um, that's why we were granted the uh, safe harbor for a year, because we hit that 0.5%. I'm almost wondering if that's not a mixed blessing because doesn't the 10 percent get recomputed at the decennial census? Yes, it does. And this is like pushing off or getting to that goal, maybe perilously close to that. Yeah, we yeah. start to bump into a lot yeah. of things on this, but but for the moment we have a safe harbor, so that's a good thing. We can elect to use that or not use that. Right? Correct. Okay. We have we have options. Okay. We have options. We're not, in other words, it's not like. You have to or you don't have to. But right. the applications right. in flight still continue, right? Yeah, so I'm going to keep so. going on yeah. how, kind of what okay. that all means. Well, shut up. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> and give me those addresses. I really will go yeah. knock on doors. Um, so Schoolhouse Commons, this is a, the St. Agnes, <coughs> used to be the St. Agnes School, right. um, 20 units, 172, uh, 172 Woburn mm -hmm. Street. This one is going along, I think, very well. It, it doesn't seem to be any opposition. Um, that's in the queue. That's before the zoning board. So that's a 40B that will likely get approved in, in pretty short order. Um, we are aware that, we just became aware that the uh, Eaton Lakeview Apartments, 160 units filed with the state. I think uh, you might have gotten a letter in your packet. Um, this or the maybe one that's actually known as El Grande. I'm not allowed to see <laughs> that. <laughs> okay. about that was my Sorry. bad. <laughs> We're not calling it that anymore. We're going to call well, it Eaton Lakeview. That. It does say Eaton Lakeview for the L, though. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we got the L, but it's in another way. So, um, so they filed with the state. They're awaiting the project eligibility for mass housing, and here's the here's the the punchline. So the ZBA must hold a public hearing, even though we have a safe harbor. You say, wait a minute, we have mm -hmm. a safe harbor. They still have to hold a public hearing, yeah. and the ZBA can decide if they want to accept the application or reject it and exercise our option under the safe harbor provision. And that's a ZBA call? Yes, it is. Okay. And does accepting or rejecting change the status um, for any other subsequent 40B, or is it done in a... Nope. No, you can take case. them one yeah. as okay. they come. All right. As they come. But this is one that we now has come into the game. Um, that we have been talking to, you have been yes. for a very long time. Yes. I mean, this has been, you know, kind of a, a long-term planning project. Yes, it was actually on the, yep. yes. it's on the green triangle. Yes. It's on the green triangle. So, I mean, the, the whole ZBA, those last two bullets become very important. Yes. And, um, I think that we're going to have a lot of um, we're going to have a DRT. We're going to, yeah. you know, we're going to try and get as many people around that table yeah. that I like to get around to talk well, that about. That really works. That's that's a good that's a good thing you do there. You know, just to say, okay, well, what are the issues? What are we dealing with? I mean, it's kind of unfair to the zoning board that they kind of have to make this call, and so we want to give them as much information as much. Well, will they have so they'll hold hold a public hearing. Yep. And. We could join them, couldn't we? Absolutely. Um, and I, I mean, could we join them in session? Um, I think that's a town council question. Uh, I think we should find that I out. I think you probably CBA? could. No, I think we should find out from town council yeah. if that's a. Do you mean like almost like a joint yeah. public hearing? We have had joint meetings in the past. We had one with CPDC. Yeah, it mean, actually worked others. out pretty well. And it worked out yeah. really well. Yeah, it actually. did. For planning, but not, not for adjudication of permits. Yeah, you could certainly have a joint meeting before that. Yeah. But whether you can That's have fine. it at the same time is Ray's question. Uh, yeah, the I guess what I'm, where I'm coming from is I think it would be good to have a yeah. discussion yep. in public. Yep. Right? You know, and I think the only way to really do that yeah. is with you know, both committees in session. Yeah. I'm just suggesting that yeah, that may a be a idea. good discussion. Yeah. yeah. All right. We already, idea, um, yeah. so if, if the ZBA does end up rejecting this, they have to do it within um, a certain time frame. They have to do it within 15 mm -hmm. days of opening the public hearing. So they have to move quickly if they're going to reject it. They yep. can't, you yep. know. Um, we have a, we have a question. So Lakeview Avenue, it's right. Uh, Lakeview, yeah, Jordan's. Lakeview um, and John. There you go. Sorry. The yellow. 
Home Depot. the Salem five cent bank. So see the see the brown. Al, it's Jordan's yeah. right there. Yeah. This is. Yeah. This is Salem five. Yeah. Right. And there's Lakeview. And Island. market baskets mm -hmm. over here, and you go down. This is Lakeview. That's it's a piece apartment. of land here, and then this it continues over here. So they're talking about raising the current apartments and rebuilding. Um, these apartments stay. Oh, it's stay. behind. Oh, behind. Them. behind. Okay. And it's then there's some more land the, over there's here. There's a field okay. back there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it does. It continues. I didn't. I didn't highlight it here, but it continues over into here. So that's, that's, there's a lot of open space back there. Wow. Yep. So where we end up right now is um, we are at 8.49, and with the schoolhouse commons, 20 units, mm -hmm. and 160 at Lakewood Ave. We arrive at 10.37. How about certainly wood? Wow. Is that in it's there? In there? It's in there. It's in there. It's in the top number in the So you're saying the two, Gene, the two that are in play, the schoolhouse and um, Eaton Lakeview? Yep. Actually take Puts us over, over the, the top. top? Yep. Cool. With room but to spare. But it's temporary. It's I'm here temporary. to tell you. Well, the, the, no, everything's temporary, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the denominator is going to change in 2020. The denominator is going to change. Thank you. The denominator is going to change. Well, wait a minute. Don't we win the game if we get to 10 before 2022? 20, no. Nope. You never win the game. <laughs> you never you win never the win. game. No. The game is rigged. Shifting sands. Trust job me, security. You can't win, you can't get even, and you can't get out of the game. <laughs> we can check out a new time. It's really going down the middle. And then at the bottom here, I just put a hey, thing where um, we do have some additional units at Johnson Woods, too, seven units. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to know when those are going to come, but at some point they will come. Um, and, you know, it, it, it feels good to be looking at this slide because for eight years now I've been working on this graphic and yeah. it never, it, I never got to 10. It kept getting, it kept getting away. <laughs> so do you, not the... Color this. Do you have a sense of how much in the um, the census would give up ground in the new, in the denominator? Yeah, it, yeah. we're we're going to be off by a couple hundred units. Yeah, we, even we spent a starting lot of time. with yeah. ten point three seven, we're still short by a couple hundred. Yeah, because yeah. so many units have been added. Because you're adding all Redding Woods in there. And yeah, lots of lots of units. A lot of units have been added. And all the units that you're building. And the subdivisions. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, that's two percent. So you go from ten point three seven, you're down to yeah. now back down to eight again. If we're lucky. Yeah. <sighs> wow. So, so Gina, there. Uh, I mean, is there a way to use <laughs> this works. one year kind of respite to then helps. maybe go and identify parcels that someone may have had their eye on a forty B and then sort of jump the gun and get it developed, not as a forty B, but you know, well, something that, else. Your job. Um, that's the, the subdivision that CPDC approved last night. That's exactly what happened. So it got un 40 bead. So they came in originally as a 40 bead? And and then not they, originally. <laughs> <laughs> it had a couple of twists and turns. It was worth it. 40B and then Multiple personalities. And the threat's still out there, but based not on now. the permit last night, they'll vacate the 40 b yeah. And there's a past 40B approved many years ago that never went anywhere. Yeah, we're working yeah. with town council to but get those a letter have a to lifespan, vacate. though, right? Uh, not really, no. No, they don't seem to. Hard to. No, it's kind of taboo. So the short version is you're, you're good for 17. You, come, you pop up again for 18. You're vulnerable until one of these hits. <laughs> but and if you do these. And if you do that, you're good until the end of 20. Until yeah. tw the 20. Right, but these aren't going to get built right yeah, away. Yeah, it's one of them is almost well, done. The red, it does, the, it's just the when movement street is. It, yeah. you, they don't even have, we just need to issue the right. uh, yeah. approval from the, the zoning board. They the don't have permit. to be built to get credit. Just file that comp permit with That's the, we got the other town clerk's B office credit. and we're good. Yeah, right. But that credit is temporary if they don't get built within 18 Yeah, there's a, yeah but I think I this project here is, but, that we're talking yeah. about, oh, yeah. I think they're, they're serious. locked and loaded. Yep. Okay. Anything else, Jim? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great report. Yes. All, all the way. Everybody. One thank you. The other so one is really yeah. good. Yeah. This is good stuff. Yeah, community development doesn't get enough credit because it's got such a long time frame that it's working on. But when it finally comes to the end, you kind of feel good that you got there, right? Thank you. Yeah, minutes. Yes. Thank uh, it's in our packet. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. You're welcome. Thank all you all. You. I'll move to approve the minutes of March 7th, 2017. Second. Okay.
Okay, discussion. Any discussion on the minutes? Um, I, the only I comment. Would, uh, John, I just have to abstain because I, I was not part of the uh, board at the time. Totally yeah. understandable. Yeah, we understand. Uh, the only footnote I have is I believe there's a misspelling on uh, Eric Burkhart's name. Yeah, B U R K H A R. I can't find it now. Yes, it's there's an E instead of a U. Yeah. Yeah, first paragraph. Yeah. There it is. Those are the only comments I had. Any other comments? All those in favor of approving the minutes of yeah, yes, uh, roll call. A uh, roll call. Barry? Yes. Arena, yes? Yes. Ensminger, yes. And Friedman will abstain. So yep. we're 4 0 1. Thanks. Certainly. Um, Thanks for hanging in there, Andrew. That was a long yeah. evening. But uh, hopefully it was worthwhile. Welcome, Dan. Um, <laughs> and welcome wait, to the team. Quickly. Yeah. Uh, your packet tonight has an amazing amount of material from FIO, so I'm not sure what they're doing except <laughs> killing trees. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I think that's it. Any other any other no. subject matter to come before the board tonight? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll just let you know that all these presentations will be on the website next Good. week. I'll move to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. All right, I have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Uh, roll call. Oh, Ooh. sorry. Oh. Barry? Yes. Barry says yes. Arena says yes. Halsey, yes. Enzminger, yes. Andrew? Uh, yes. Okay, guys. You Thank can stay you on much. if you want. We are yeah, yeah. The next hour of the meeting. Knock we'll yourself silence. out. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, Andrew. Right. Go have some fun now. All right. Enjoy Southern Thanks, California. Andrew. Safe right. trip. Thank you, Bob. All right. Thank See you. See you on the second. All right. Bye. All right. Good night. Not a bad running the first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this before. Sure. Absolutely. Can we make faces? Kind of like like the world, like the world, like just the World Series. Yeah. Well, this kid got hurt. He was almost killed. Yeah, she saw it happen. And that was part of it. Uh oh, here we go. We're getting it. What am I, Chuck?